ルームビーズームテストしています。両方に聞こえています。よろしくお願いします。えー、このルームはイングリッシュのチャンネルで、えー、中継いたします。はいえー、では、えーと、ズーム側から今、質問をしています。まあ、マイクオンになってますので、答えてください。はい、聞こえております。こちら、聞こえてますかはい、ばっちり聞こえております。ありがとうございます。大変良好です。はい、よろしくお願いします。はい、お願いします。
join the Zoom? Uh, well, sure, how I mean, do I share my screen? That's uh, the question. You have to uh, get into the Zoom and share your screen via Zoom. Um. Thank you. Should I join this mic? Ah, uh, yes. Did I get a link to the Zoom meeting somewhere? Um, yeah, um, you open the uh, uh, Discord and go to the Hall B. Yes. And uh, there. Yeah, hello. And you can share the screen. Bye. Uh. Okay, and we probably want to meet with PC. I am muted. Okay. I think you're and all where can I move? Um, I, tend, yeah. I tend to walk around a lot, but I guess I should not. Um, this is the camera, I guess. So probably somewhere like there and here, I guess. Yeah. Stay behind the podium. Yeah. And you can uh, take the mic and <coughs> put it close to your mouth. Yes. I can do that. Okay. Hello. So it's gonna start in about a minute or so. So I'll introduce you, then I'll. And if we have enough time at the end, then uh, some. We have a 45 minute session. Yep. And even though I. I have problems with it in terms of the slowdown as much as I didn't before. <laughs> and I have a good reason that I didn't like that before. So, There, there was some feedback from the online people that you know, um, you have to my microphone has to be completely yeah. on. Otherwise, feel free to go. Oh, yeah, right. sure. Test, test it.
えー、では、13時になりましたので、講演を始めます。えー、ここからは、えー、ヨハンさんによる、えー、Transparent Infrastructure as at Uber です。Hello! Thank you for having me here. It's an、uh, honor and a privilege. I promised also that I would try to stay still behind here. As you can already see, that's difficult for me. I work as a software engineer at Uber in Denmark. The nice thing about being in Japan is that, contrary to my home country where I work for Uber, here I can actually use Uber. I have promised the very kind interpreters to try to speak reasonably slow. This is extremely difficult for me. Usually, I'm very, very generous with words. I use many, 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 many words to not say very much. So that, that got me thinking that some friction, like an interpreter, that, that could be good and cause me to reflect. But like, If this was every day, I would probably be tired. So maybe、uh, that's also like what are the frictions when we build our software that causes us to like, get tired because they're every day? But I guess that's a topic for open space tomorrow.、Um, just to give a sense of Uber, around 20 million daily trips, average Q2. 2022,、uh, more than 100 million monthly active users,、uh, different verticals Uber, Uber Eats, Uber Freight.、Um, and it's not that I'm directly involved in all these, I'm very much down in the infrastructure level.、Uh, but just to give a sense that the scale of the problems we solve are very large. I work on developing our stateful platform. So everyone is on Kubernetes, but we build our own. It is named Odin after the Norse god Odin. And we run stateful workloads and containers on our platform MySQL, Hadoop, Redis. Presto, Schema is our own internal service. Of course, Grail, that I will talk a bit more later.、Um, but we run around 40 technologies on this platform, each owned by relevant technology teams. And we build the platform that they use to orchestrate their workloads. The scale of our platform is around 75,000 physical hosts, primarily in our own data centers, but also some in cloud. We operate on around two and a half million CPUs with two exabytes of disk space and around one million、uh, Docker containers. I think we are around. 25 people on the team building the platform. A very simple overview of Odin. We have a fleet of servers, each running the Odin agent. The Odin agent communicates with the Odin services, a large. A、fleet of services, our API that can also be accessed through a command line and a web interface, and of course, also by systems themselves. A large part of our orchestration engine is cadence workflows that are the actors in most of our systems. And then, of course, Grail as our.、Uh, Integration data 
data integration layer. I will come into more uh, information about that. And basically the operating principle is reconciliation loops. What is our desired state? Let's apply it. Let's submit our actual state and compare it to our desired state. Let's keep reconciliating. And of course, as this at this scale, we will never be done reconciliating. This is managed as a single fleet of nodes and hosts. So what is Grail? Grail is the, the database system that uh, uh, my team, uh, a reasonably small team, also is uh, maintaining and, and building these days. The goal is to simplify building robust, easy to use operational infrastructure at Uber scale. And we do that by building an integration platform to provide near real time infrastructure state access. So this very large fleet that we have running many nodes we have less than one minute delay in querying its state at all times. So our goal is to give human operators the capability to effectively debug and generate insights through exploration. Right. There are some human operators who are on call, who are trying to optimize. And how do we best give them the insights they need to perform their task the best? But we also want to give robot operators the capability to effectively and safely make decisions to increase the reliability and efficiency of our infrastructure platform. We're working with stateful workloads. How much disk any given should, even given any given workload should be allocated is not a trivial problem. And at least in my previous experience, it is set once. And then it may be updated when it runs out of disk space. We have automation solving that problem. Before we had Grail, there were many actors in the system. An actor could be a script, it could be a service. We have many sources of data. Those could be configuration systems, other systems, and how they interact and the connections between them are not a small problem. And then we can, when we consider we also have tens and tens of thousands of hosts that could all contribute some piece of data. Then we have a large problem. Yes, and all these could also be accessed through CLIs. So while this, of course, is a gross oversimplification, what Grail allows us to do at this scale is to combine many independent data sources into a single source of truth for our infrastructure fleet. It allows us to ask questions of our system right now, such as how much available capacity do we have? How much capacity do we have across different server types? Or across different data centers? Again, allowing human and robot operators to effectively and precisely ask good questions. 
We could also ask questions such as how is cluster food distributed? If we look at how is it distributed across hosts or across racks or across data centers? These are really interesting questions to be able to answer. If for instance, there is some weird performance degradation in some cluster, right? We are not as worried when things break, obviously, right? That's not as big as a problem because things that break, obviously, they tend to be easier to debug and fix. Someone pulled the power plug on this server. Okay, we noticed that and we can figure that out and we know when we fixed it. But someone reporting on a cluster, we are seeing a slight but consistent degradation in this cluster's performance sometimes. Those are very different and difficult questions to answer. And of course, Grail is not the only part of being able to answer those kinds of questions, but it's an important part. So it really allows us to do complex debugging. It really allows us to get understanding of our system because we can actually ask meaningful questions about our system. And not only will the question have fresh data, again, meaning sub-minute uh, liveness, most queries we do as exploring will also have that kind of query performance, meaning we will still be, the data will still be fresh when we get it. So the, the current scale of uh, the Gradle deployment we're running is uh, we serve around 45,000 queries per second. Uh, we have a good amount of nines in uptime. In the aggregated graph, there's around 53 million objects and every minute 11 million objects are ingested, meaning they are updated or created. Some of the attributes of Grail that are important is uh, that it is a non-durable memory cache, which is the nice way of communicating to our stakeholders, we might accidentally throw your data away. We will do our very best not to, but we do not have it as a guarantee. The primary uh, situation where this becomes a very nice and strong property to have is if something uh, goes uh, down, if we have an incident, being able to simply not care about recovering the data, but only the system is a very uh, strong handle to have. As discussed earlier, we have near real-time querying. Our data is also globally replicated. So it is a single graph representing our infrastructure state, which is again, a very powerful uh, property to have. And we're like eventually consistent or perpetually inconsistent, um, depending on your view. The largest consumers of the Grail system is Odin that I mentioned before, and also Up that runs the stateless uh, platform workloads. Um, but at the time of speaking, the Odin platform is by far the largest consumer. It was the Grail was developed in the context of uh, Odin, and then other people thought, well, we can use that over here as well. The primary components that we have are uh, some data sources. These are called Grail providers. So they could be anything from a host agent 
to a service doing some uh, health checking. We have an ingestion layer that is uh, responsible for actually passing the incoming data, for validating its schema, validating whether it's, uh, the data source should be throttled, uh, and uh, ingest that data into our Grail backends, which is where we get our distributed consensus, which is where we actually get our, our data storage. And then we have Grail frontends, which are our query layer, layer our uh, aggregation layer. The Grail providers could be running anywhere, could be running on up, could be running on Odin, could be running on hosts, could be running, I don't know where, all the places. Our ingestion layer is running on uh, up, the stateless platform, and can be independently scaled. And our backends and frontends are running on Odin. Our frontends could be running on up, except they will not allow us to run large enough workloads. So we're running them on our own platform. But each of these components are uh, individually deployed and configured. Uh, then we also has, have, as a side note, our web interface that is also running on up. Uh, and of course, it is important because that gives the developers a reasonably nice user experience while doing explorative work. But from uh, the perspective of how uh, we have structured Grail, it is not the, the most interesting part of the, the question. So basically, Grail allows us to think of our infrastructure as a graph. We have hosts that are running on nodes. A node is a part of a cluster. A cluster is a part of an instance. A host is in a zone. A zone is in a region, and so on and so forth. And each of these parts of the graph can be decorated with information from one or more data sources. So one data source, let's call it foo here, might contribute some information to the region objects, some information to the zone objects, and some information to the host objects. While a service called Odin might contribute to the instance cluster and node objects. So all these services contribute to our infrastructure graph and it is aggregated into a global view, not just of uh, data sources, but also uh, in terms of geographical regions or whatever we call it. So Grail, ends up being basically a property graph where we have objects that are nodes in our graph. An object could be, again, a host, for instance, or a rack, or whatever anyone wants to represent as an object in this graph. All sorts of different providers, different data sources, of course, have different domains and different semantics. Uh, and Grail doesn't care about that. If you want to have a terrible Viking or whatever object, because that's the most important part of your domain, then that's up to you. We might have a discussion on naming, but uh, other than that, it's okay. On objects, we attach properties. So, for instance, on a host, it could be a host name or a server type. Uh, there might be a different data type, data providers giving different sorts of data. So one piece of the data could be, I know all sorts of stuff around the host configuration. So I will contribute that part to this host. A different data source may say, I know everything about the workloads that are running on this host. 
And then that will contribute that part of our graph. And then we have associations in our graph between objects. Again, there can be many things. It could be an association from a host to the rack that it is on, or it could be an association from a node to the cluster it is a part of, or any sort of relationship that we might want to represent in our uh, infrastructure graph. Basically, our data flows uh, from the sources over the ingestion layer into our database persistence layer, and then out into our query layer and aggregation engine. And again, this flow is usually much faster than one minute, but uh, in general, sub minute but then we also of course need to be able to get some data out of grail and for that we have yql uh, uh, language we came up with ourselves when i started on the team i was like so the database is called grail and the query language is called YQL. What's up with that? But apparently uh, in, in the Denmark office, as you could see from the Odin platform, we like the Norse mythology and the tree of knowledge in the Norse mythology is called Yggdrasil. So originally Grail was called Yggdrasil. But that seems to be very hard to pronounce for anyone who's not Danish, basically. So uh, it was rebranded, but still the query language we have, we have that left. So in this query, we do a very simple extraction. We start from a object in this case with wildcard. So this starts me from, from all hosts in Grail. Select the field Mimia host server type as server type. So extract this uh, property. And I would also like to this uh, clause to be true. In this case, this filters out all the hosts that we know about that are not managed by organ. I run this query and uh, one of the entries that comes up, we can see in the screenshot. That shows us basically, I get the ID of the host with the data I asked to get extracted. As it was a graph, we also want to be able to traverse the graph and we can do that through scan, which allows us to follow an association so in this case, I start again from all hosts, and then I follow the association storage node. Uh, and in that, I drag out the technology, like, uh, and I want to see only give me the hosts that have more than one node, more than zero nodes running on them. So in this case, this would give me all the nodes and what technology they belong to running on all our hosts. But that can of course be a bit hard to just, now I just have a very long list and each element in my list contains a lot of elements. So we can also do some transformations. So in this case, we do the same thing. We start from our hosts, we scan the nodes, only in this case, filtering out the nodes that has the technology Cassandra. And then we reduce that through uh, an aggregate, through uh, a pipe into basically, rather than giving me all these objects, just give me the length of this list. 
Then we filter out the node counts that are zero or less. So we only want hosts that have nodes actually running on them. We remove some of the part of the result that we don't need, and then we flatten the result. So this concrete query then gives me all the hosts that are running at least one Cassandra node. Again, this could be a good vantage point for debugging, especially if we start to consider other factors such as uh, data center or specific clusters and things like that. Or we could say a different aggregation could be the frequency where we, in this case, we grab out the server type and then we do a, a frequency analysis on uh, the server type. So this could say, how is our free capacity in this data center distributed across the different data uh, server types? Or how is this cluster distributed against different server types? Good. So the power of Grail is basically that through global replication, that is, we have a single representation of our infrastructure fleet state with near real-time query availability, meaning that we can ask not what, what was the state yesterday, but what is the state now? With a decoupled and extensible data model, as we talked about with the providers, and a powerful query language. We build, run, and operate a world-class stateful platform at planet scale. Currently, there are no uh, plans, unfortunately, to uh, open source uh, Grail, which I apologize for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think, I hope this has given some insight into how we think about actually getting the ability to ask the questions of our infrastructure, of our fleet, that enables us to do sound operating or software engineering in our systems. And compared to other places I've been working, like just being able to answer simple questions, figuring out what is factual, what is real, and not guessing and not traversing through all the UIs you can find, but being able to get something tangible in your hand when you discuss whether A or B is a good thing or whether things are broken or working. Um, so I hope at least to have inspired some sort of that. Thank you. And there is uh, time for questions, I think, unless uh, the track host is moving to get me off stage. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation on Grail. I think it's a very, very interesting uh, approach. Um, I was curious about what would you say was the main driver in order to have such a custom implementation like Grail? I mean, sometimes within the DevOps community, we tend to glue technologies together to solve the same problems. Sometimes the route could be to customize or have a very custom solution so we can have a full understanding of it. Was it because there was no other solutions that could do the job better? Or was it because the scale was just too great? Or what, what was the main, the main driver for this? Thank you for an excellent uh, question. I think, unfortunately, Grail's inception predates me. Um, but I think it is the systematic Bible who says like any complex successful system evolved from a successful simple system. And 
the stateful platform evolved in itself from the need of running exactly one technology in Docker, namely schemaless our own uh, database service. And at the time, at least, there were no viable alternatives at the scale we are doing stuff at. Whether there concretely are viable alternatives now, I don't think so. That supports the same level of, of real time querying processing while having the same decoupled uh, uh, architecture. But hopefully, I'm wrong. Um, but I think it's it's a question you all have to ans ans answer all the time, right? Um, I'm very much buy before build, um, but I, I don't. I, I haven't seen anyone who has the same insights that that we have. I, I hope that was an kind of a non-answer. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, you mentioned it before. Planet scale is a completely different question. You know, yeah, it, it's like it's the the classic one. Uh, but but Google does this, or Facebook does this, or Uber does this. Yeah. But most people are not. <laughs> and, and I think the the most important thing is to solve for the problems you have. And uh, I think as software engineers, we have this tendency of uh, being cursed with brilliant foresight into everything that can potentially ever go wrong and almost no skill in discerning which of those things that could potentially go wrong are important right now. Thanks, thanks a lot. Hello. Um, so my first question was going to be, is it open source? So thank you for the yeah, slightly unfortunate answer there. Um, so I'm curious, and maybe you won't know since you're saying you arrived after this was developed, but what was the reasoning for wanting this to be a globally distributed system rather than a, you know, single central location with a, you know, proxy kind of query layer or, um, something like that. And then how are you actually achieving this global sub one minute ingestion time? Um, so I think one point is that the aggregation has to happen at some layer. Right, so you could either have all of these data sources sending to one central location or do what you're doing. Yes, so in, in general, we uh, have two types of data sources those data sources that we consider global, meaning that the data they provide are considered being a global snapshot and data sources that we need to replicate at query time, basically. Um, and of course, uh, that is how we, we replicate uh, across our stack. Uh, I think uh, in terms of how we achieve it, uh, there's, of course, uh, some amount of, of resources going into actually just uh, operating the stack, uh, both in terms of uh, like uh, uh, compute resources and some very, very, very smart engineers have, have spent quite some time optimizing the system. So there are still things that, that we come across where we optimize the system, but overall the model has proved itself to be sound and to be an efficient uh, model uh, and then it kind of is dependent on how fast can you push the data through the system uh, the system is overall and i can't believe i'm saying this reasonably simple in what it's trying to do with the data so that also does not incur too much of a, a penalty um so i guess that's that's kind of, of how it is. Uh, we're building on top of uh, the draft library from uh, HSD. That's also like business uh, proven to be a successful uh, framework. You're not running into issues with the actual raft algorithm though, in terms of the actual gossiping back and forth? 
we are not running into that very specific problem with the raft uh, implementation. Sometimes it's more of a, a, a me problem of understanding what uh, is actually going on. Uh, but uh, like in performance, we are seeing uh, reasonably uh, good good things. Um, we have also uh, all of our uh, pillars or whatever we call it are decoupled. Uh, so also one of our scaling methods is to have multiple uh, backends. Uh, so we combine different data sources into a single backend, and then we can add more uh, data sources to a single backend or add more backends depending on how we want to scale that uh, layer. Our ingestion layer is running on our stateless uh, platform. Uh, so that is also independently scaled. Uh, so I think it's like the the, the TLDR answer to your question is probably because each layer is individually scalable. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, it was super interesting. I actually had two questions, but the first one was the same. Um, pretty interesting that you guys build your own orchestrator um with the sla that you showed um and the second one so the sla i showed was for gray okay i was not about not actually odin. know what the sla is for our uh like odin scheduling platform but i okay it is excellent great um and my second question was about the query language that you showed um so you guys use it to have a state of your infrastructure, your architecture, but do you use it also as a configuration to deploy your infrastructure or what do you use actually to automate your infrastructure deployment? Um, you have something like what, yeah, what, what infrastructure does, as code or is it the same language that you're using? What does infrastructure as code mean right now? I just have to... Uh, For example, Terraform. Um, so... In terms of the stateful platform, there are uh, basically when we get a host, it is in a state where it is usable for us with the agent deployed on it. Right. Uh, and then we, uh, we use, uh, you could say that our desired state configuration and our actual state, which is like, I'm not a Kubernetes uh, guru, but uh, so, so someone please correct me. So basically what you put into ETCD in, uh, in Kubernetes, a bunch of that goes into uh, Grail for us. Um, something also goes into ETCD and that's a different story for someone else to tell. But uh, we, you, we have been using Grail as our like uh, reconciliation loop, uh, publishing uh, actual state and, and desired state uh, into Grail and then having host agents or, or whatever system try to reconcile uh, those. Right. So when you have any um, modification to do into your infrastructure, you go through the same configuration to do that modification. I think that is a question that is uh, way beyond the scope of, uh, of this talk. Uh, exactly. The, but uh, like something has to provide the data that is uh, that that ends up uh, with your goal state. Uh, and again, most of our uh, changes are doing by uh, not by humans but by robots. Uh, so uh, how how is that happening? What are the things that are done by systems? Uh, we do both up and down and uh, right and left scaling of, of stuff uh, based on on this data by by robots. Uh, but in some systems, of course, everything is also uh, migrating from something to something always, right? Uh, so there are multiple different ways of doing this simultaneously. But then we have the, the very good advantage that different data sources can still just provide their stuff into Grail. Different data sources can just uh, pull their stuff out of Grail. And that helps any transition period. Um, yes, sorry for the non-answer. Thank you. Hi, um, I wanted to ask, um, are the components of Grail hosted in 
the resources that Grill is overseeing. So if that's the case, um, if in the case of major outages of Grill, how do you debug or how do you perform your complex debugging on the issue when you don't have access to Grill? <laughs> so it becomes like a, a issue where your debugging tool goes down. How um, in that kind of situation, how would the operations team or how would the developers um, tackle this situation? So luckily, that very rarely happens. Uh, and again, as we have uh, some regional uh, isolation, we should uh, be able to get uh, some insights from somewhere. Um, and it also depends on what is the area that might be broken. Is it our, uh, for instance, is it our query layer that is completely bogged down? such that we have to cut off some uh, call sites or whatever it is. We also have tons of other observability metrics like uh, uh, time series, uh, alerting, uh, all sorts of uh, logging stuff that doesn't go into Grail. Uh, and in, in all cases, you debug through also aggregating across different sources, right? That's also what you're doing. Uh, but uh, there is a bootstrapping problem uh, and there's also that if we had to have to spin something up and we use grail to run the platform that we used to run grail uh, how do we go about that but we have tooling for, for those things um, but of course when things really break things really break uh, usually when you design systems like this the the failure mode is not that all the workloads stop running it is more that no decisions, new decisions are made. Uh, so that also means that it would likely be different parts of different systems that are breaking, not simultaneously. So again, that also alleviates the problem a bit. But again, catastrophic failure is going to be annoying. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, for your answer. Yeah, that answers my question. Thank you. Otherwise, uh, I will be here today and tomorrow, and there will be awesome open spaces tomorrow also. So if there's anything you would like to uh, discuss, then uh, that is the perfect time for that. And feel free to just uh, flag me down. That's uh, the best reason to be a speaker, is then you don't have to come up with the icebreaker. Right, then people will come to you. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and attention. The next presentation will start from 2 p.m.
Okay, so we are starting the presentation by uh, Sue Duruko, and the title is Re Reliable and Faster Deliveries Com Complete Test Automation. Thank you. So, hello everyone, welcome. Uh, it's very good to be here. I already see that there are more people at this compared to last year. I was here uh, last year as well and uh, two years ago. So it is uh, being uh, becoming better and better after the COVID time. So my name is Mr. Turkal and uh, I'm again very happy to be here because uh, it is very good to meet with people passionate about software development, some good uh, development practices and some good uh, testing practices, the quality assurance practices. Personally, I'm a, a test automation engineer. I'm working for Indeed Japan. Uh, originally, I'm from Turkey, but I'm living in Japan for more than two years now, almost two and a half years. And uh, in daily basis, I'm doing the test automation. Nowadays, uh, I'm a quality assurance engineer, but most of the time, what we are doing in terms of uh, achieving the quality assurance is doing the testing activities. It is not only testing, but most of the time. And when we are talking about testing, of course, it is, uh, there is no way to skip test automation. We will talk about test automation as well. So uh, in this session, the, uh, generally the main idea would be the role of QA uh, in the whole development lifecycle. How we can achieve uh, delivering a good product in terms of uh, quality assurance, like how can we achieve to uh, provide a good product or the correct product to our customers? by what kind of quality assurance activities we can achieve this? How can we support our target or goal by different activities or uh, quality assurance uh, facilities? So the uh, schedule will be like, we will first uh, start by discussing the general uh, success criteria. Like how can we understand that we are successful the, to uh, give the correct or the good product to our customers? What will be the Co uh, correct success criteria. On what kind of metrics can we concentrate to understand if we are giving a correct and good product or not? And in the second part, uh, based on top of this success criteria, what kind of uh, activities we can perform to achieve our goals or targets, we will discuss. This part will be mostly like the activities which are supporting the test automation because the third part, we will already discuss about test automation itself, but test automation cannot achieve everything because even if we uh, succeed 100% test automation, we will have a lot of issues. We will have lots of different difficulties. Sometimes we are doing, for example, in my company, in my organization, we are doing some bug bashes, like everyone in the project sits uh, together and try to find some issues in the product or some maybe usability, uh, bugs or issues and sometimes they complain like we are finding a lot of bugs what are you doing when you are uh, automating the test cases yeah of course we are finding a lot of bugs in test automation that's already there but still there can be lots of different issues that we can find when using the product right because test automation cannot cover usability issues or maybe there are lots of different user experience aspects which cannot be caught by test automation. So first we will talk about different activities that we can support test automation. And then we will discuss te test automation itself, like what are the potential uh, risks or uh, issues, difficulties when doing the test automation. And finally, we will wrap up. So let's get uh, started. In the introduction part, let's little bit talk about how we can understand we are uh, delivering the correct product to our customers. Our customers are waiting for some delivery, right? and we will provide uh, something that we uh, built or prepare for them. Let's go over a restaurant example. Some customers are uh, sitting in the uh, tables in our restaurant and they do some orders and they are waiting for our product. We will develop some product. Nowadays, most of the products that we are developing is a software, but it can be anything like, even in this example, like we will prepare a lunch or dinner or whatever. So this will be our product. So how can we understand that we are providing the correct or the uh, good quality product? So this can match to some success criteria. The first one is the correct product. For example, 
if I order pizza, let's say, let's say, and if they bring me a pasta, okay, I like pasta as well, but I want to eat pizza, right? It is not the correct product. Even if it is a very good pasta, it is super delicious, but I don't care. I want to eat pizza. It is not the correct product for me. So you already realize what I'm trying to say, right? It is the difference between the verification and the validation. First, we can verify all the functionality is uh, already there. The working is functioning properly. But if this is not the product that the customer is waiting for, looking for, then it doesn't make sense at all. So giving the correct product is very important. And then even if you are giving the correct product, for example, I order pizza and they bring a pizza. Okay. But how about the quality of pizza? Like, is it delicious? Is it fresh? Is it maybe cold or hot already? So these kind of aspects are kind of like in the first part, we discussed about the scope. But in the second part, we are already discussing, discussing about some other aspects, like maybe most, uh, most of the time non-functional aspects. How fresh it is, how, uh, how is the performance or the other aspects. And then finally, of course, we should talk about the price. Nowadays, of course, money matters all the time. And eventually, how fast it was, how fast the delivery, because uh, if I'm very hungry, I go to a restaurant, and if I wait for, let's say, one hour, two hours, then this is not acceptable, right? Eventually, I will give up, and I will go to another restaurant. So, which means we will lose our customers if we are not uh, giving the delivery on time. So, this was just an illustration, right? It's just an example. But we already discussed some concrete metrics, actually. What we have discussed in the previous slide, we discussed that the correct scope is very important. Functionality is very important. Non-functionality is also important. And of course, cost efficiency and the speed of delivery. These are different aspects of the quality. So this will be the pillars that we will concentrate on. So how can we achieve uh, these uh, or uh, maintaining these pillars? Let's a little bit talk about some different activities that we can perform. First of all, starting with the correct scope. For example, when we do the functional testing, of course, it is a, a mixture of the verification and the validation. When we are doing functional, functional tests, uh, we expect our conditions that we want to give or provide to the customers is already there and they are working properly. So this is both like the correct functionality and the uh, properly working functionality. This verification and validation. But sometimes the, there is a human aspect of the usage of the product, right? For example, when we are using some maybe web pages or navigating through our web application, we can have a feeling or like an intuition, like if the product is easy to use or it is not. For example, sometimes I don't like the web page at all. I don't know why. Okay, it's just a human factor. Maybe I don't like the colors. Maybe the contrast is not good. Maybe the text font is not readable enough or not easy to understand. But somehow I may have a feeling that this product is not very good. I, I didn't like it. So even when using the mobile applications, the products, you may have this feeling. You somehow you don't like and you just delete to remove the application. So these kind of aspects may not be caught by automated testing or the functional testing. So what we can do is, I already gave you an example, like we can do bug bashes in which all the parties of the project, like the developers, the testers, because quality is not the responsibility of only the testing team, right? So maybe we should invite the developers or even end users if we have a, a direct communication channel to them. So uh, gathering all together, we can do a bug bash. Like we can try to reveal all the difficulties or issues which present in our product. And similarly, we can do the dog fooding activities, which is mainly called like using the product that we develop by ourselves before just uh, letting it go into production. First of all, let's see by ourselves when we use it for our own, own uh, development purposes, how easily we can use it. We will have an understanding 
of the usability and the other aspects of uh, the product. And uh, we can, of course, direct communication is very important. Most of the time, uh, this is uh, something that we face, right? We develop something, but we don't have any idea about our uh, target profiles. We are developing some product, but who will use it? I, I don't know. I I'm, I'm just a developer. I'm not a business analyst. I'm not a marketing specialist. I don't have communication with the end users or the clients. But I don't I have to be a business analyst or I don't have to be a marketing specialist. Even as a developer, I can do direct communication. This is one principle from agile practices, right? The direct communication, if there are too much layers and it, it is difficult to maintain a clear communication, we will not have any idea about the target users or the profiles. So uh, supporting our test automation with all these kind of uh, activities uh, would, uh, would make our test automation activities even more successful and help our uh, targets or success criteria uh, even uh, in a better or more efficient way. So one more thing that we can do is we already talked about getting familiar with the target users, right? So one way to do it in a better way is just developing some personal-based testing. For example, we can imagine different uh, types of users who are likely to use the products that we are preparing for them. This will uh, give us some imagination about some use scenarios. For example, if I create three profiles, uh, as it can be seen on this slide, the first person is a senior uh, person and by the way, a geographical location is also important. And they are mostly the most often use cases or their typical activities is very important. So the first person is a senior person like the 80s year old person. And he is based in APEC, like maybe let's say Japan. And what he is doing mostly on our web application is maybe he is mostly reading the news. He is interested in politics. Okay. And when is he frustrated? For example, if there's huge text uh, fields and if it is not easy to read, for example, if the fonts are real small, then he will be frustrated. This is the first profile. The second profile is another person, like a younger person, a male, based in Europe, some European countries. And what he is doing is he, he, he is interested in gaming and when uh, he is playing some games. He is using lots of different shortcuts. Okay, not, not only the mouse actions, but from the keyboard as well. He is doing lots of different shortcuts. So alternative uses as is important for him. And the last person, which is a female and 19 years old, a young person, uh, based in the Americas, and what she likes is she is uh, putting a lot of posts in social media, and she is she really likes getting some interaction with the end users. And what she likes is she is not using only one browser, but she is using lots of different browsers. So based on all these profiles, we can have already some ideas. For example, for the first person, not only the functionality, but also accessibility is very important, right? I already have an understanding of his use cases because he likes reading news texts but maybe he might have some difficulties for reading texts. So if there is a voice assistant in our application, it would be great for him. He loves it. So I can do some uh, supportive accessibility testing uh, uh, life cycles or the uh, activities. And I can validate that I have a, a voice assistant in my application. And for the other users, I can go through uh, different use scenarios. For example, I already talked about a geographical location as well. For example, I will give you an example from my actual project. In my project, I'm working with the teams based in the US and they were executing their test cases on a Chrome browser. And I started my activities with the same approach. I implemented my test automation and I started executing them and on a Chrome browser. But then, I talked to the product owners and they said that in Japan, people allow iOS or MacOS operating systems. They allow really using the relevant mobile and the desktop devices. So at least half of the traffic is coming from Safari browser. 
If you execute only on Chrome, it would not be enough. All right, so if I was not based in Japan, but I was preparing this product, delivering this product to some target profiles living in Japan, I would miss this aspect, right? For them, executing on Safari is very important. And it would even affect the choice on the test execution libraries or the tools that I'm using. For example, where at the time that I chose the test framework that I will use in my environment, uh, I started with Cypress. Nowadays, they are supporting the execution on Safari as well, but at the time they didn't. So I had to change the framework that I'm using in my environment. So I migrated my test cases from Cypress to Playwright. So uh, going over different user profiles will affect your approach and will help you to develop a better scope and do a better uh, test coverage. Moving on, in terms of the functionality, so how can we measure the success of our uh, functional test cases or the functional test activities? For example, we can measure, the, the most popular metrics are maybe we can measure the test coverage, right? Or automation coverage. Let's say I have 100 test coverage. What does it mean? All the requirements or all the specifications are, are covered by test cases. I have 100 test coverage. But still, do I know that I'm doing the perfect awesome uh, test activity? I'm not sure because test coverage is not the only metric. So if we stick on some uh, certain metrics, most probably we will miss some issues or the health of uh, our processes. But we should do a comprehensive monitoring activities. So on top of the automation coverage, the health of the test cases or the strength of the test cases is also important. For example, I can cover all the specifications, but those tests are not catching the bugs which may appear in production. So the coverage is there, but the test cases which are covering those specifications are not written or developed uh, enough in a good way or good approach to catch the issues. So to measure the strength or capability of test cases to catch the issues would be uh, some uh, applying some uh, intentional issues which are injected into product port, which is called as mutation testing. I will introduce some mutations into the product port. Intentionally, I will introduce some issues and I will observe if my test cases are capable of catching these issues or not. So this will give me an idea about the strength or the capability of my test cases. Moving on, the next uh, side, the other side of the medallion will be the non-functional aspects. We, so far, we only discussed about the functionality. So the non-functionality would be like the performance or the reliability, robustness, maintainability, recoverability, usability, lots of different abilities. Accessibility, again, based on top of the uh, geographical location, internationalization, or maybe observability, there are lots of different popular aspects of non-functionality, right? Even uh, nowadays, accessibility is very important. Some, if you are developing some sites uh, prepared or maybe provided by government uh, sites or offices, there are even some uh, reg regulations that you should introduce some accessibility features. So we can cover those by lots of different non-functional testing activities. For example, uh, there is one activity that we can do, which is chaos testing which will ensure that even in the worst cases, like some part of the system will go down. And in this case, we will observe how the other parts of the system is reacting to this situation. So the whole system just goes down and becomes uh, not responsive. Or when some parts of the system is down, the other components are somehow capable of managing this issue. Maybe they will buffer this data, which uh, was not, uh, uh, succeed to communicate it or uh, transfer to the other parts. And when the, uh, that part which was down is up and running again, then the buffered data would be communicated or transferred to that uh, specific date, uh, module or the component. So this kind of activities uh, will help us and support us to cover not only the functionality, but also the non-functional aspects of the product. 
And speed, of course, the last uh, aspect of a good delivery we discussed in the restaurant example was the speed, right? If we are delivering this food in two hours, then the customers would already leave. So speed is important. And how can we speed up our delivery? So first of all, if we have lots of different manual tests, we can replace them with automated tests because most of the time, not necessarily, but most of the time, automated tests are faster than manual tests. So if we have lots of different manual tests, we can replace them with automated tests. This is the first thing. And then even we, if we have a good automation coverage, our execution can be still slow. I implemented a lot of test cases. I have already automated test code, but it's running very slow. So how, what can I do? If I'm executing only on one machine or only on one uh, execution, I can introduce some parallel runs, which means I can divide the whole set into different subsets and I can assign them to different virtual machines. So in this way, I can start all of them in the same time. So uh, all of them will be executing in parallel. So it, it will already reduce the total execution duration. And even if I introduce the parallelization, still there can be some slowly running test cases. So what I can do is I can do a time analysis and I can figure out which test cases are running slowly. And then after going over the relevant execution, I can understand the root cause for the slowly running test case. Why it is slow? May, maybe I just put some dummy weights, right? which was not necessary. So I can replace them with some smart weights or there can be some different root causes. So the thing that I can do is I can do a time analysis and go over the individual test execution durations and figure out which test cases are going or running slowly. And then after finding the root causes, maybe it is normal, right? I don't know. Some test cases may take too much time compared to the others depending on the use case. It may be normal, but there's another possibility. I might have some test smells. So we will talk about what test smells are in a minute. So what I can do is I can just uh, reveal those kind of issues, root causes. I can try to eliminate them. So automation is great, right? We, without automation, we couldn't imagine performing all testing activities with only manual testing. Because nowadays we are talking about CI, CD continuous integration, continuous delivery. So we are pushing some new commits or new changes every day, not even every day, every hour, every minute. So think about running the test cases manually after raising new MRs or just pushing some new commits. It would not be possible. But if we have some uh, automated tests, we can just let it the, uh, run on the CI CD pipelines. The jobs can be triggered when we push any commit or when we raise an MR, before we merge our code, uh, including some changes, and we let it go in production. First of all, we execute test cases, why? Because we want to ensure that these frequent changes or frequent updates do not uh, break the working functionality, which is mainly the uh, regression testing, right? Because in Agile, we are very open for changes. We can frequently have uh, updates or changes, but this should not break the working functionality. In this case, it would be already going to production. So customers would already be starting complaining about our product. Automation is great, we need it. But there is a but part, there are some difficulties and issues while we can encounter while we are doing the test automation. What are them? The first one we already discussed, which is the speed, which is the execution. So we already discussed that we can introduce our test executions in every commit, or maybe even every merge request, or maybe nightly job, whatever. So at some frequency, we should execute our test cases. And if our test cases are taking too much time, for example, let's suppose we are putting some new commits, we are changing the code, but we are waiting for the test cases for three hours. Come on, I cannot wait for tests to complete in three hours. I have a small change. As a developer, I will be starting complaining. So uh, execution speed is very important. And we already discussed about the execution durations. There is one more thing which can uh, slow down our execution or our uh, build. 
What is that? Any guess from the room? Uh, any person who has a thought about what can be the reason if my build is very slow or maybe uh, blocked due to several reasons? I have already a hint on this slide. Any guess? Yes, please. Sorry? Flag test, exactly, yeah. So my test case should be running very fast and the, the, the execution can be completed just on time. But if my test case are not stable, if they are not robust, if they are not flaky, one time passing, one time failing, then the pipeline would be blocked, right? Because test case failed, I have to block the release. Just a moment, just a second. Uh, we have a failing test, so do not merge yet. Let's figure out what, why this test case is failing. And then we figure it out that this is a false alarm. This is not even a real bug. So we just waste time for nothing. This is the real bug and the false alarm. Let's talk about this distinction. So some test cases can fail due to some different reasons. And if this issue is a bug, is a real bug, which means it is an issue stemming from the product itself, then it is a real bug. But on the other hand, if my test case is failing due to any other issue, which is not stemming from the product itself, product is working properly, it is working as expected, my, but my test case is failing. Well, why? I don't know why, I can have lots of different test smells. There can be lots of different reasons. Maybe I'm not waiting for the uh, response properly. If I'm working with asynchronous products, I send my request and then I want to immediately check my response, but the response is not ready yet. It's an asynchronous operation. I should wait for the response properly. This is just one type of test smell. If you make a literature survey, you will find more than 100 types of test smells. There are fragile tests, there are flaky tests, there are uh, scope-related uh, test issues, test smells. There are dozens of them. But the main idea would be eliminating and getting rid of uh, these kind of test smells. How can we achieve this? We should maintain a good code quality in our test automation framework, right? Code quality is not only in the product code, but it should be in the test code as well. So what we can do is we can do some or introduce some static code analysis tools. It can already do some checks, but other than that, we can do some peer reviews as well. So nowadays we can use even machine learning algorithms, right? Nowadays, everyone is somehow using chat GPT or other machine learning algorithms to fasten the automation activities. For example, we can do even code reviews by the help of machine learning algorithms. For example, if I somehow teach machines my uh, patterns that I want to apply, or on the other hand, even uh, the anti-patterns that I want to avoid. For example, if I'm having a magical number in the code, like a hardly coded embedded number in the code, this is an anti-pattern, right? I don't want to do that. I maybe want to introduce them over some different variables or maybe config files. So if I teach this to machines, and then they can warn me that, you taught me that having embedded or magical numbers in the code is an anti-pattern, but here I catch, I detect a magical number, please go and fix it. So it can be already in a, a very fast and reliable way to do the uh, code review activities. But also, of course, we can uh, do the peer reviews, we can send to another colleague in the team, and we can collect different feedback in terms of the code quality. Moving on, well, one more thing that's, uh, which can make life really difficult for us is the duplications, because we are already talking about different challenges that we are encountering in doing the testing activities in our projects. And what are those challenges? For example, we are testing some comprehensive products nowadays, right? The, the products that we are testing, the systems under tests are working on lots of different platforms, not only in desktop. Sometimes we should execute on mobile devices not only on a certain browser, we can execute on all the types of browsers or at least the ones which are supported by the system. And we said that Agile is very open. It is welcoming the change requests. So there can be some frequent updates or frequent changes. So what does it mean? If we have any change, then we have to relevantly 
update our test code as well because if the behavior is updated but if uh, the test code is still trying to cover the previous behavior then we would not be covering the correct scope so if the behavior is changed or updated then we should update our test code as well accordingly but this is a continuous maintenance effort right and when we want to change something if we have lots of different duplication we have to change a lot of uh, different classes or the implementation for example let's suppose i have lots of different test cases and in each of these test cases, first of all i go to my landing page and i log in login is the first step in all the test cases and then i continue with the rest of the test steps the rest of the test scenario so for login first of all i, I was providing my uh, credentials my username my password and then i was doing the login and then one day the development team decided to change the login algorithm i'm not supposed to give my credentials anymore but i just want to or have to uh, gather some a token access token from some other apis or other uh, interfaces and i have to attach this token to my requests so the whole login operation changed what should i do if i place this login steps into my spec files i have if i have 100 spec files i have to change 100 different spec files but what is the alternative if i implement this login algorithm in in a separate class like if i implement a helper class which does the login steps for me and if i just call the relevant functions or the methods from the relevant class from the spec files even if i have to change login algorithm i don't have to change all the spec files right they are just calling the relevant function if i change the relevant class helper class then it would be the change would already be reflected to all the spec files so duplication is something that i want to avoid and i want to minimize so uh, what does duplication relate to in terms of the test execution any idea any thought from the room to what can we relate duplication in terms of test execution we can relate to reusability so if i somehow am able to implement some reusable test cases i will not have to implement a lot of duplication i will implement one test case and it will be executable on lots of different configuration for example i have an example here this is a very simple test code very simple one like here i have one line which is basically this is implemented in cypress but forget about the framework or the tool that i'm using it is just uh, locating some elements and then it is a text element and it is uh, clearing the field and then typing some queries only one step i have in this test case and the expected result is i'm doing here an assertion which is like after i start typing i want to see some auto completion suggestions like as the search engines that we are using google or yandex or any other when we start typing, we already see some auto completion items, right? So the same functionality is in my system. The system that I'm testing here is a job seeking website. So the job seekers can go to these websites and perform some search. Like they can search for the engineer jobs in Tokyo, for example. They will provide a query and they will provide a location. So in this test scenario, I can execute this on lots of different websites because uh, most of the people living in Japan will uh, know it. Uh, we can have lots of, we can build lots of different uh, websites for the same purpose. For example, if this is a job seeking platform, I have the townwork.com website. I have the Rikunabi Haken, Rikunabi Next, what else, from A, and some other tests, uh, some other websites. Why? They are all doing the same thing. We can all search some jobs. So why do I have lots of different websites? Because the target profiles are different. One of them is only for the part-time jobs. The other is only serving for the nurses or any other major. So there are lots of different use cases, but the usability, the same scenario is applicable on all these websites. So even if I'm going to Townwork or Rikunaba Haken, what I can do is I can just uh, do a search in a certain location with a query. So this test case is already executable on lots of different configuration. For example, what I will do is I will pass the uh, execution command uh 
yeah, it's a re with uh, providing the relevant spec file. This will execute this, but I can provide some other execution arguments. For example, I can select the browser on which I want to execute. And I can select the environment, for example, uh, by some environmental variables, for example, on which application I want to execute this. Because did you realize there is no URL in this, web uh, in this test case? So how does it know if I want to go to townwork.com or you can have a hacking website? How does it know? Because I'm introducing some environmental variables here. So I'm generating the URLs, the links that I want to navigate dynamically. After reading the configurational variable, I just built my uh, URL to be navigated. And similarly, I can introduce uh, several environmental variables, like if I want to go to the development stage or QA or even a production stage. After reading all these configurations, I can build my uh, dynamic variables and I can execute the same test code without changing the code itself by just managing the configurations in lots of different uh, scenarios or the environments. For example, in this one, uh, a very simple test code, like uh, I can change the browser to three different uh, environmental variables or I can change the other uh, configurations as well. So eventually this one line testing a functionality can be executed in 48 different configurations. So I don't have to duplicate the uh, same test code, right? If I just do the hard-coded uh, variables into the spec file itself, like the first one was just go to like cy.visit townwork.net and then I would not be able to execute the same for the Rikunabe hacking site, right? Because it is already going to town work. It is not dynamically generated. I have some magical values. But the main, the main idea here is excluding the environmental variables from the test code itself, make the test code itself reusable, and then manage the configuration separately. This is the main idea. Moving on, this is the last part. So we develop and introduce lots of different development approaches to achieve my uh, success criteria and the success targets, the goals. But how can we measure it? How can I understand if I'm successful or not to provide these targets? So we need a continuous monitoring activity. How can we do that? Let's a little bit talk about the monitoring activities. So first of all, we can customize the tools that we are using. For example, I want to read the uh, average execution or average implementation duration, let's say. For example, on every test automation task, how much time I'm spending. For example, to automate a test scenario, I'm spending, let's say, four hours, okay, which can be like one point or half point uh, in my scrum board. So I want to have an idea about average implementation time that I need to automate test cases. How can I do that? I can go to the issue tracking system that I'm using. It can be Jira or it can be any other uh, platform. And I can read all the fields. But if I don't have any field which is giving me how much time I spent on this task, then I would not be able to uh, read how much time I spent on this. So what, I, what we need is the visibility or the transparency. Our tools, should be transparent enough to give us an idea about all the metrics that we want to chase. For example, if I'm interested in the time that I'm spending on designing test cases, like the writing the test steps, generating the test scenario. For this, what do I need? I need to read the timestamp on which I change from new to, de to uh, design and from design to designed, like maybe in review or whatever. So these state tra transitions I have to read and I have to subtract the relevant timestamps. But if I don't have this status, like the test life cycle starts from new and then design and then designed, which is like in review and then implementation, automation, and then final code review and completed. This is my custom workflow. But if I do not introduce this custom workflow, custom lifecycle into my tools, if I just go with the default template, like default template is every task is starting with new and then in progress and then done. If I go with these three status, I will not be able to read the transition between design and in review, right? Because 
I have only new in progress and done. So what I have to do is I have to customize the workflows defined in the tools that I'm using. What else? I have to choose the metrics. If I ask what kind of metrics can we use? I'm sure we can list 100 or 1000 types of different metrics that we can chase. But it's not possible. It's not feasible to collect all the metrics. So what we can do is we can select a subset which is serving to our goals in the best way. For example, if I'm con concentrated in the uh, making executions more efficient, then I can select the metrics which is giving an idea directly related to the execution. So selecting the good uh, subset is very important. And then we can categorize them and we can accumulate the results. We should do the continuous monitoring. If I do only once, maybe it uh, might be misleading, but I have to spread this collection in time. I have to accumulate different results. And of course I have to interpret because I just, if I just collect the numbers, numbers will give me some information. They are very useful, but numbers are great. But of course I have to be smart enough to understand what's happening after reading the numbers. For example, if I want to measure the coverage, I see like I have 80% test coverage. So what, what does it mean? This metric itself doesn't have a meaning. Or let's say we want to collect the number of bucks that we have. Okay, in the sprint, we have 10 bucks. So what, what does it mean? It doesn't make any sense to collect the metrics themselves, but we have to combine different metrics all together. And we can, we should do a analysis, comprehensive analysis, and we should interpret the results. This is why we should do the continuous monitoring compared to the last sprint, if it is going up or lower. For example, we apply some different approaches and we see the results. After applying this new approach, the bug number is going higher or lower. How did it affect to the quality? Still, it might not be the only factor, but it will give an idea about the health of the processes. So I will just give a few uh, concrete examples, different metrics. For example, we discussed uh, in the first example, the restaurant example, the, the quality and the speed. These are the two very basic, the very fundamental pillars, right? Quality and speed. And how can we measure the quality? Of course, we can do a, a quantity measurement, which is like maybe the coverage, but not only the quantity, but also the quality as well. So this we already discussed, right? right? We discussed about the importance of a mutation testing, not only the coverage, but how capable my test cases are in terms of catching the issues or the potential bugs. On the other hand, in terms of the speed, we discussed about automation coverage. If we try to execute all the tests manually, then most probably it would be slow and there would be no chance to do the parallelization, right? So automation is important in these regards. And even if we have uh, the, a good automation coverage, we, they can be still running slowly. So execution duration is important. And we discussed already about the flaky test, the false alarms. And whenever we have some failing tests due to some test smells, how easily we can fix. For example, we, all, we know that we have some flaky tests and the next step is fixing them, right? Getting rid of these test smells. So at this point, how easily we can apply our fix? Our test case is maintainable or recoverable. So these are the different aspects of the code quality in our test automation framework. So I just left some examples, uh, some thresholds, just to uh, give an idea. Uh, and these are covering the metrics that we discussed under these two fundamental pillars. And uh, one uh, example application that I applied in my project. So what I did is I added some labels into some uh, tasks to just understand which tasks are relevant to my purpose. For example, my purpose is just getting an idea about how much time I spent on implementing test cases. So first of all, I label some of them. So in this regard, I can do some queries, right? I, I can filter out the tasks, which are only labeled with uh, the relevant label that I put. For example, in this case, it was just test underscore automation. The other tasks, I'm not interested because these are the tasks relevant to test automation. I, I'm interested in how much time I'm spending on these tasks. 
And after that, I'm reading the timestamps. So I'm reading the relevant state transition. So from in progress, which means I'm still doing the implementation to either done or um, I uh, again set it back to new. I just give up, I stopped the implementation. So I just want to uh, know the time spent on in progress, which is basically still being implemented. Uh, and this is uh, finally after uh, collecting the metrics using some dashboards. These are very helpful to understand what's going on in our environments because if we do not transform the metrics or the numbers into some visuals, it might not be that much straightforward. But if we utilize some visuals, like if we use some line graphs or pie charts or some different types of visuals graphs, it would be much more straightforward to understand. We can directly see what is the distribution among different aspects or categories. Or we can see directly the trends, like if the values are going higher or lower. So these are just uh, different examples of different dashboards. So visualizing the numbers or the metrics that we collect uh, into some graphs or charts would make life easier for us to do a, a smart interpretation and an analysis on the metrics that we collect. So let's... Uh, uh, wrap up what we have discussed. We talked about the role of quality assurance in terms of giving the correct product, providing the good quality product to our customers. So basically doing a good delivery. What is the role of quality assurance or what kind of quality assurance activities we can do to support our delivery? And our main goals were just the quality of the delivery and the speed, of course. If we are too slow, then we would be behind the schedule and our customers would go to some alternative solutions. And then we talked about test automation is great and it is actually indeed needed because otherwise it would be really difficult to cover the comprehensive scope, but test automation itself is never enough. Okay, we, we need the manual testing always. We need exploratory testing because the name already itself implies it is the user experience as users, as human. We need to understand what the customers or the end users are feeling or what are the, their frustrations are. Even when we are using by ourselves, maybe we will already feel that, wow, this is very difficult to use. How the customers will use it? Come on, let's change this. So uh, we will already have some understanding or feeling about the use cases or the usability of the product. And in terms of the automation itself, we discussed about test smells and the difficulties. Uh, so we discussed how we can uh, eliminate those test smells and we can improve the code quality in our test automation framework. And finally, we discussed about the continuous monitoring. Uh, we discussed uh, about utilizing some different dashboards and graphs. So that was all about the uh, role or the place of quality assurance in the whole software development lifecycle. I hope you enjoyed and thanks for listening to me. And you, if you have any questions, I'll be more than glad to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mesut. If anyone has a question, um, we have to prepare for the next presentation. So please, right. if you can, you know, ask at the lobby. Yeah, yeah sure. Yep. I, I'll you. be there. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So the next presentation is from uh, 3 p.m. Yep. Please come back later.
If I go too fast, for example, they can open the English channel. Can I do that or? Okay, okay. so you, you want to check. So if you have your own If there's a if there's a question from the online uh, attendee, we'll, we'll just uh, okay, so we don't have we will be hearing from the attendee. No, no, I think Oh yeah, so yeah, the Zoom thing, the, the, the translation. Yeah, the communications thing is probably the question, right? Yeah. 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 Ye
Recording in progress. Yeah, I can see myself. Like this. I let me check how that will look like. Let's just do the Uh, yeah, we'll need <laughs> filter, I guess, like that. Is it close enough? Like that? Okay. If I speak like that, or I need to go a bit closer. Like that, right? If I do like that, <laughs> it's gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to. This is gonna be weird. Shouldn't move too much. <laughs> The next presentation is by uh, Nick Vermande. The title is Building Apps in Kubernetes the DevOps Way Tools, Trick, and Tips. All right, thank you very much. So I'm going to try the uh, icebreaker sentence. I'm going to try my best, right? So, Konnichiwa, session ni sanka shite itadaki, arigatou gozaimasu. <laughs> Thank you. It's my very first time in Japan, and I, I, as you can see with my tattoos, I'm a big fan of Japanese culture. I even have like some kanjis with the name of my daughter. So I'm very happy to be there. Uh, so today there's a lot of viable for this presentation, and I'm also going to do a live demos. So we need to pray the God and sacrifice some goats, maybe <laughs> if we want that everything goes as planned. 
So this session is building apps in Kubernetes, the DevOps way, the DevOps way tools, trick and tips. Um, so really the, the idea of this session is I'm going to walk you through some, through some of the tool sets that are, I would say, required when you start developing microservices from your local laptop up to the point where you can test your application in Kubernetes. So my name is Nick. I've been working for the last approximately six years on Kubernetes, um, exploring both CNI, so the Container Network Interface, CSI, or the Storage Interface. Uh, but maybe first question, uh, is everyone familiar with Kubernetes? <laughs> yeah, a couple of you? Yeah, uh, that's fine. Okay, then we're good. Um, I enjoy coding automation and DevOps tools, sample apps. So uh, I'm the head of DevRel at Spectral Cloud. So Spectral Cloud is a company who, which provides uh, managed Kubernetes services in the sense that we sort of run sure next generation. Um, and to show like some of the open source capabilities in the cloud native space, I really enjoy coding um, applications. So our application for today is going to be clearly overkilled. Um, so it's going to be a dad jokes generator using five different microservices and uh, the GPT-3 model from OpenAI. So hopefully it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so I've got a, some slides. I'm going to go quickly through them, but the goal is really to show them those tools in action. So you can first make up your mind on, on those tools. So it's been, I mean, it's opinionated. I've chosen to use those tools, but other are also available, but at least you will have the experience going through that with me uh, with those tools. So uh, the agenda for today, I want to explain to you what probably you may be familiar with that the inner loop development is as opposed to the outer dev loop, which inner loop development is going to be mainly the focus for today. We're going to th go through the tools, the application architecture, because the dad joke generators is clearly overkill, but it's a good, I would say, you know, um, it's a sneak peek in terms of what you can find as a true cloud native application as defined per uh, the cloud, um, the 12 factor apps. Um, then I'm going to go through building the app. So the app is, the code is already there, but we're going to see how you can start from coding. It's in Golang. So start the coding to uh, creating containers with the various microservices to deploying locally with Docker, Docker file and moving up the layers to Kubernetes. And we will include things around security, how you can encrypt your sensitive information, how you can sign your container images, how you can make sure that um, only signed images are allowed in your cluster with policy management, Kaya Verno, all of that in 40 minutes. <laughs> so it's gonna be challenging, but at the same time, it should be a lot of fun. I tend to go super fast when I'm talking. So hopefully I will need to slow down a little bit for the translators, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so first off, what is the inner dev loop cycle? So it's basically everything before you push your code to source control like GitHub. So it contains like writing code, building your code so that you can test it. And of course, deploy your run into your local developer environment. So when I say that local uh, developer environment, it doesn't necessarily mean that you run everything locally. You can have like a Kubernetes cluster running in a cloud somewhere, or you can be using Minikube or Kind or anything like that. So today we're gonna be using uh, Minikube. Everything is basically running on my laptop. And then the outer loop is basically everything in terms of the enterprise CI CD pipelines. So, but you will find the same sort of cycles, but the, the scale is different because it involves multiple teams, multiple projects, but the same you know, cycle from build, test, uh, create container images, push container images and deploy. But those two, I found over time, I noticed is kind of loosely coupled. Um, especially as we are talking about shifting lefts. I don't know, probably you've heard this term about you know, shifting left everything, which means bringing things closer to the source code and to the developer. Things like testing, testing your high availability capabilities, your storage and your security, right? So you should test the security tools you're using in production. You should bring them locally on your laptop as much as possible. So you can increase your security posture. There's less likely a chance that you will hit security issues if you, breath, if you bring security into your own you know, local testing. So um, 
we have mainly three phases where we're going to be using tools. So there's called the code phase, there is the build phase, and there is the deploy phase. Um, so usually when you start working as a developer, you want to deploy microservices. Of course, you have your local ID. Uh, so Visual Studio Code is one option. Of course, you have uh, Vim, um, you know, Geeks, or you have Emacs. I know there's those two schools. I don't have any preference really, but I tend to use um, Visual Studio, Studio Code because there's a lot of plugins make things a lot easier. In terms of remote development, which is also a trend, you find tools to help you develop directly into remote containers. Um, and the idea is quite nice because it makes your development environment shippable and repeatable. And when you are adopting DevOps principles, you know, when onboarding new engineers, then you can also use a single container image as your development environment. Uh, some examples, you know, like um, uh, GitHub as, um, you know, the ability to run dev container. Um, there's Git um, Git pods and, and others that also pre, um, you know, propose this sort of environment, which are, are quite useful. Um, things you need to pay <clears throat> attention to when starting to code locally and then migrating to containers and Kubernetes is environment variables. So you know, that this is something you have to figure out from the beginning, how, how you're going to manage your variables, your user inputs or your microservices inputs. Um, in my experience, I tend to see a lot of things that are that are hard coded in the code, and this is a bad practice. And through the different tools, I'm going to show you how to um, to use those you know different hooks to insert your uh, environment variables. Um, in terms of using Git or any uh, source you know uh, version control systems, uh, we're going to be using a tool called Precommits that allows you to run uh, specific actions before committed committing your code. So even before committing, there's a way when using pre-commit to check certain things, like are you leaking um, sensitive information? I'm going to walk you through an example. And because it's, it's done pre-commit, it also prevents you from pushing your code with sensitive information included. So how should you work with sensitive information? Um, so today we're going to work with SOPS, which is a tool from Mozilla that allows you to encrypt your sensitive information and um, commit this in, I mean, encrypt it into, into your uh, repository, which is great. And then you can have the CICD pipeline just uh, decrypting as long as it does have the right you know, keys that are installed. We're gonna be using Git leaks with pre-commits exactly for, for this purpose, uh, we, to, to be able to detect if you are committing sensitive information. And the last thing when you start coding you know, microservices or cloud native application, first you should read um, the 12 factor um, application uh, manifesto, I would say, that will guide you through you know, how you should start uh, building architecture for your microservices. And today's, even though this is just for dad jokes, I've tried to implement those principles. Um, the next phase is how do you build, right? If you want to create your microservices, so typically, every microservice will correspond to a container. So usually, you start with local Docker file to build your container locally on your laptop. Then to compose your, so it's mainly one container or multiple container that are not related. Then you can use Docker Compose to, again, locally in your Docker daemon, build your microservices. Right. So you can declarati declaratively um, specify what type of services you need, and then run your entire microservices cloud native application as a single command, just do Docker Compose app. Now you also want to automate that, not necessarily you don't want to be uh, you know, building the image, running Docker Compose every time. Um, so you build Makefile. So Makefile is not something new, probably we've been using this for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years, <laughs> something like that. So still there. And then when it becomes Kubernetes specific, this is where our, I particularly, particularly found that um, it tends to be difficult for a developer if you don't know Kubernetes. And what I've also noticed is a lot of developer don't, de don't, don't give a, no, I'm gonna stay not too vulgar. So don't care too much about, I'm in Japan, right? So I have to stay polite. So, <laughs> 
they don't care about um, Kubernetes that much. So using customized Helm raw manifests, I mean, of course it's good, but if you don't have like Kubernetes knowledge, it may be challenging. Uh, so we're gonna see like some of the tools that can help you build that automation there. Um, so that's basically tools like DevSpace, Scaffold, Tilt, Gitpod, all those tools allows you to predefine um, or to use those tools will help you predefine manifests and way to deploy your containers into a Kubernetes wrap with minimum effort. So which basically doesn't, um, you know, it, you don't need to have this deep Kubernetes knowledge to test your application, right? Because from Docker containers, then you have to move towards like pods, deployment, stateful sets, all those sort of things, right? So you don't want to have to, to deal with this as a developer. And in terms of deployment, yeah, you can deploy locally without any issue today using tools like Minikube, um, Kind, and K3D, which I mean, all of them can use Docker. So today I'm running on an ARM-based computer, so this is a Mac M1, and I'm gonna be using Minikube with the Docker driver, which basically means that we are going to, to run um, Kubernetes inside Docker, right? As easy as that. And the tool we're gonna to be using is DevSpace, um, which, um, I mean, I've tested Scaffold, DevSpace, um, Gitpod as well. I think, yeah, DevSpace is pretty much one of the most customizable. And it has one feature that is really interesting, um, which is you can change your code live, recompile your code and run it, test it without having to rebuild the image from scratch. Right, so you don't want to build the image every time you change your code because it's just unnecessary, you know, just wasting time. Um, and then security, this is something you have, as I was saying before, you want to implement this as early as possible. I know it can be a, a, a pain in the neck. Is it polite enough <laughs> to say that? <laughs> to, to include security early because usually security tends to slow you down. But today we, we really have tools that doesn't prevent you from going fast. So SOPs that we are going to use to encrypt secrets, case SOPs, which you can use SOPs with customize as a plugin. Then if you're going into more like production-like, there are tools like Vault, Conjure, CyberArk, uh, Seal Secrets, all of that to manage your secrets in production, but that's not really your problem as a developer. Your problem as a developer is really avoid committing um, un encrypted information into PR or re your repository. That's the main thing. The rest for the enterprise, you know, like when you deploy into production, not really your problem. Uh, what is also your problem is the container you build out of your code, right? So um, you want it, first you want your container to be signed. It should be something that is part of your local work. It's easy to automate. Uh, so you should use a tool like Cosign or Notary. Probably Cosign is the most, um, used the easiest to sign to make sure your your container are all signed and then you can use more like check off or dive to see you know what your container is composed of and see some of the best practices you can use also trivi to scan your containers um, and make uh, sbom or software bill of materials which is also super important to track every library you're using into your code so uh, we're going to see also live how you can use sift to create uh, software bit of material and, and then use Gripe or Trivi or Claire uh, to scan the potential vulnerabilities within your container. So this is really a key component. And then um, when you move up the stack, when you deploy things into Kubernetes, so again, this part is mainly the outer loop already because it tends to run into your production cluster, but this is also part of the shift left, I would say, philosophy where you should run Kaiverno, Opa, or Daytree or any sort of admission controller that will tell you before moving to stage, you know, it's just saving time and increase, I mean, enhancing your security posture so that Kaiverno, the admission controller, the role of the admission controller is to say, okay, you are running this container. You want to deploy that container in Kubernetes, but it's not signed. So I'm preventing you from deploying that container into the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so it's easy because you're running already into your local Kubernetes cluster. Just deploying Kyverno is just an extra step. It, it takes five seconds. And at least it will tell you, okay, 
my container is not signed, so I'm not going to push it into Docker Hub or my uh, registry, uh, you know, my company registry. So it's important to have this part already into your development uh, cluster that will help you, you know, deploy signed image only. And as I was saying, admission controller prevents unsigned images to run in the cluster. But this, this step is, is enough. So if you implement those simple best practices, is, it gives you, you're going to be probably the most, um, you know, hype developer in your company, <laughs> right? Because you're going to do things right. Okay, let's go into the day in, day in the life of a cloud native application. This is my famous that jokes generator application. Um, and then when we're going to modify joke, uh, the, the joke generation, I'm going to try to, I don't know if Chuck Norris is popular in Japan. I'm not sure. So we can change to Chuck Norris or cat jokes, whatever works best in Japan. I'm not sure, probably cat because it's uh, kawaii, right? So the idea of <laughs> the application architecture, app, I mean, I told you it was overkill, right? So uh, as a user, I wanted that joke. So my joke server role is to provide an API endpoint on slash joke. Then the joke server is going to publish, <laughs> just reading through it is <laughs> it's totally overkill. But anyway, it's going to publish a message to Nats, which is a message queuing system. The role of the joke worker is to pick up uh, that message and to do the task. So the task is to perform an API call to OpenAI uh, using the DaVinci uh, GPT-3 model to generate the joke, <laughs> save it into the database, um, cache it into Redis. If you do more than, I think that's 20 requests, it's going to pick the jokes into the, uh, <laughs> the cache first. And then um, a second step, the joke server also publish another message, which is please save the joke into the database. So everything is asynchronous, which is quite representative of how you would build a cloud native application if you want to scale. You want to use like asynchronous system. Uh, messaging system like Nats or Kafka is probably the best option uh, to run in Kubernetes. First, that shows that Kubernetes is ready for this type of more stateful application. Um, and also, you can scale you know, in, in, independently the joke server, the joke workers, and then just in, in terms of the bottleneck, you can also have you know, more memory for the NATS uh, microservice. So yeah, that's basically the, the full app workflow is there for your reference. I'm not going to go through uh, the whole thing, but basically I've got save joke, I've got get joke that get published to the NATS from the, the NATS messaging system from the joke server. The joke worker is going to save the joke and request the joke, and and that's basically it, right? And serve it either from the API, the OpenAI API directly, or from the Redis cache. Okay, so um, let's do this now. It's been twenty minutes, so I've, yeah, twenty five minutes to go through that. that. Should be enough. So first off, I'm going to go through some of the demo components I want to show you. So if I, the demo.txt. So we're going to show, start with just the application structure and, you know, Docker file. So here, this is my uh, development environment. I have a couple of um, folder here. So traditionally in a Go project, your, let's say, binary are, I mean, that's a pattern I've chosen. It's, there are a couple of them, but yeah, this one is quite common. So you have a CMD folder where you have um, different folders, again, subfolder. Every one of those folder correspond to one microservice, which means that I need a Docker file for this joke server and joke worker as well. Then I've got um, a common layer where I'm defining constant. So typically this would be um, defining URL some environment variable that will need to change depending on what environment I'm using. I'm just making a pause so that translator can translate all that. <laughs> and then this joke.go uh, has all the functions that are going to be used by the joke worker to perform uh, the task, right? So because I'm calling out those modules from the code, the worker, and the server code, right? You can see I'm importing the joke and the constant there. Um, 
And because Go is statically compiled, it means that everything is going to end up into my binary, like the joke worker binary and the joke server binary. Everything that is required is going to be compiled into the binary there. So I have mainly two Docker file. Um, the rest, like MongoDB, Redis, all of that, are typically uh, out of the box container, right? So you can use Docker Compose or you can use Kubernetes operators if you're familiar with that to deploy those services, but it's not part of your main code. What well, the only thing you need to do is provide a URL, a URI to, uh, to connect to those services. So the Docker file is pretty easy, right? I'm just uh, basically go mod download to download all the different modules I need uh, and then uh, copy the code, copy the, the, the folder, I mean, for the dependencies and then just compile it. And that's basically it and run it as a binary. So that's the joke server, which is serving the, uh, the API endpoint. Same thing for the joke worker. The only difference is that um, you can see the joke server in the end is just exposing a port, port 8080, so that you can request the joke. The joke worker, the only job, it's really to respond to and listen to the NATS messages. So it doesn't have to expose any port. It's pretty minimum. Uh, and basically, this is what you need. So when you finish creating your uh, Docker file, you need, so of course, you can just build the image, check it works. So if you're using a Mac, you probably need the build kit, uh, especially if you're using ARM and you want to uh, create a container for um, x86, you would need to use uh, the Docker build kit, but you can easily automate that. And then when it comes to deploying, you really want to have the full application deploy, not only your two containers, right? Because you need all the extra, extra components. So here I've got a Docker file where um, the services I want to deploy are my joke server. So just again, specifying the path of the Docker file, which port I want to expose. And this is where you need to specify some of the environment variable. So there's a couple of ways to do that with Docker file. One is to here, like just hard code it because you know in Docker file, the name of the service here is gonna be the name that you put here, right? So it's, that's very easy, that's very convenient. So you don't need to like, you know, hard code an IP address or anything, just use the, the service name. And the second one, you can use also like environment variable. And the good, I mean, the nice thing is, it's gonna be Docker Compose is gonna use the dot, if you declare, if you declare this file, a dot and file. So this is my super secret open AI <laughs> API key that you know now. <laughs> uh, but as you can see here is grayed out, meaning that of course in Git ignore, this is key for you, right? You don't want to commit anything very sensitive into um, your upstream repo, right? So make sure to include there if you need to test. But here I'm just like setting this variable there and calling it out here because I need it. The worker, because it's gonna call, call out the OpenAI API, you need the key there. Uh, and then it's very also convenient because you can define services you depend on. So which one needs to be um, created first? Then same principle for the joke worker. So the joke worker needs a couple of other environment variable. So again, you don't want to hard code this into your code. Like if you building those cloud native apps, then you need to do that either, I mean, with the tool, the tooling you have around in the wrap basically. So here, this is Docker file. So same principle, uh, the services that depends on, and then you can add the services that are available out of the box because my code is really joke worker and joke server. Joke server. The rest, is just predefined images I can get from Docker Hub, um, from Nats, from Mongo, and Redis, right? So this is the work really is minimum. So even though my microservice is relying on, I mean, my application is relying on five different microservices, I really only had to build two containers. The, the, the other ones are already available from Docker Hub. So let's, try to do this just first. Um, so if I do Docker PS, 
I should, oh, it's already there. So uh, I'm using make file, right? So, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to show you as well. And then if, you, if you're coding um, and building, you know, test the application quite often, you want to build your make file. So <clears throat> it's not necessarily, you know, it may take time. To be honest, this make file, <laughs> I just asked chat GPT to make it for me. <laughs> and I just had to, you know, correct bits here and there, but it's really efficient. So I think chat GPT for us as developer is making our life a lot easier, at least saving a lot of time. So here I'm just using make deploy to build my container and to use uh, Docker Compose app, right? And I'm just using make clean to destroy basically everything, right? So now I should have Docker PS and I just, I have nothing more other than my um, Kubernetes cluster. So now if I run again, my make file, so make deploy, it's just gonna build my application and run it, pulling the images. And then I should be able to start using the app already. So that's my first phase, right? Using Docker Compose to test locally, but I don't have any uh, Kubernetes cluster yet. So building the containers, come on, internet connection. Okay, <laughs> first thing. Uh, uh, Okay, I'm gonna fall back to the video. <laughs> so typically what you should have is this, right? So you're there, Docker PS, you should see the container running and then you can curl the, the, the joke server and then it's gonna start generating joke. So here, for example, I'm generating 30 different jokes. And after 20, it should be a lot faster because it should go through the Redis cache. And this is something you can quickly check because it's going to be a lot faster. So the first ones are really going into the, yeah, you can see the last 10 ones are taken like in random order from the cache. I mean, the quality of the jokes are not that great, <laughs> but still, I mean, what do you call a fake noodle? I mean, pasta. Okay, I'm not sure this is really fun, but yeah, this is fun from ChatGPT, right? So that was the first thing to test, which was a nice failure. <laughs> but this is the risk when you do things like make clean, just to clean everything. I'm really hoping that the Kubernetes demo is going to be a better. Just let me check that I have internet connection. Maybe because I don't have, uh, let me, yeah, should be fine. Like just ping Google. Yeah, it's good. Okay. So hopefully the next phase should be fine. Um, then the next step, if we go back to our um, demo. So we've seen Docker file, Docker compose, uh, the make file, you know, to automate everything. Now the SBOM part. So in terms of the SBOM, you can use SIFT. So the first is, you know, just easy. If you're using a Mac, brew install SIFT, um, and then just specify the name of your image you have pushed to Docker. It's going to load the image. It's going to tell you all the software components that are installed in that, um, in that image. Okay, so you can see all the images that are required by uh, your container. So I'm using the default Golang container, so which comes with all of that installed plus um, all the library you have to install for your application. So now what to do next is you can use the same thing, but then you can generate again with SIFT, 
you can generate the um, SBOM in a JSON format, right? So you can do this. Again, it's gonna do the same thing, except this time it's gonna save everything into JSON. And then you can use gripe that will take this file as an input to, sc to scan for potential vulnerabilities. So now I can do gripe, <coughs> excuse me. You specify SBOM and then the path to that JSON file is gonna generate like a lot of content. Let's do it, right? So let's not grab, but first it's gonna, it should be fast because it's just a file. <laughs> Come on. I think we're gonna go back to the video again. <laughs> Let me. Great worker. All the, all the server, maybe. Let's try with the server. I may have some internet issue. I don't know. Okay, let's go back to the video again. So, it should be there. So this part has been done. All right, so we are here. You generate the JSON and then you can use, so this is the JSON file. Okay, and then you can use gripe first. Then it's gonna tell you all the vulnerabilities from um, the software bill of materials, which is everything from negligible uh, to high um, to critical. So in that particular example, uh, you can just grab for critical and I have like seven critical, 92 high, 65 medium, eight low. Uh, and this is from the native Golang image, right? So, um, and then you have to take action. It doesn't fix anything for you, but it gives you a good idea of what you should be fixing. Here, for example, they, there is one fix, right? So which means that if you're not using those libraries, you may want to remove them, or if you're not happy, or if your security team is not happy, instead of from Golang, you should use from scratch and build your own container image. Or even better, if you're coding in a particular language, um, maybe you have a default image from your company that you should use. Right, but here it's a, a good practice every time you're starting to develop something to use those tools. It's super fast and um, yeah, it just take five minutes, all right, when it works. <laughs> and same thing for the joke server, right? So uh, for the joke workers, that's basically it, right? Okay, so that's for the SBOM and um, the vulnerability scanning. So now the next step, okay, signing images. So is as easy again, hopefully I'm not sure it's gonna work with the internet, but as easy as that, right? Again, you specify um, the, the, the container image, cosine, sign. And if you do just sign, it's gonna use OIDC. So it's gonna open a page, a web page, like where you can sign, right? So you don't need to have private and public keys. You can just use OIDC to say, yeah, it's me. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna sign the image. Now, authentication successful, and that's basically it. So now it's pushing the signature, and then you can do cosine verify here to check, come on. Yeah, I'm missing one component. Yeah, this one. It's gonna tell you if the image is, um, is signed. So that's the first thing you want to do. Once you have signed, okay, here it's gonna tell you, right, this is what I've checked, everything is fine. So now you can push that image into, into production, right? So you do the same thing for the joke worker and any container you want to deploy uh, into staging. But as I said, it's more like a tool you, you may want for production, but it's a good thing to shift left and do that as part of your you know, development, local development life cycle. 
So the next step is how to encrypt sensitive information with SOPs, right? So remember, I have this uh, file where um, I've got all my, um, where was it here? Uh, what was it again? In my, my magic API key, which is in the dot and from my Docker here, right? So this file here, this is something you want absolutely to encrypt. Um, so now if you're moving to Kubernetes, you want to get this configuration. Typically in Kubernetes, there's two choice, right? If you want to provide an environment variable, you can either use secrets or you can use config maps, right? Uh, but regardless, if you test on your laptop, I mean, secrets are not really different from config map in the sense that secrets in Kubernetes are just encoded in, B in base 64, which is different from encryption. So here I'm just going to use um, config map for that. So here it's just a test, right? So here I'm creating a config map named OpenAI API key from my OpenAI API key. Um, unencrypted file and just putting it into dry run into a YAML file, which is basically representing my Kubernetes object. So you can see here, if I do, if I display it now, you can see my open API, open AI API key in clear. So now you can use SOPS. So with SOPS is using uh, PGP. So you need to create prior to that your private key. But here everything is already defined. Um, so I think am I in the right directory? Let's check. You need to have like a configuration. Uh, a dot. So I should have it in the. Uh, where is it? Got this file here. Joke server worker. Is that the, let's try it here. So the only thing you need to do is sub slash E and then encrypt this. Uh, oh yeah, it's not there. Oh, let me use the video again because I can't remember where my configuration file is. So that was trivi. So that was the cosine part here. Here we go. So we have done this. So subs, where is it here? Uh, uh, uh. Just try to find this. If not, yeah, never mind. I'm going to show you the results. So imagine that this command succeeded, right? And so the you end up with this file here, uh, which is encrypted. Uh, in the deploy, I believe. F space. Oh, it's there. Subs.yaml. Sorry for that. So in the subs.yaml, this is the configuration you need. So now I'm going to go, sorry for that. So deploy, and we say deploy dev space, right? Deploy dev space. If I run this command again, then it should be, oh, no, it's not. okay. Uh, yeah, never mind. So you end up with this file. So it's the same thing. I just encrypted my config map. As you can see here, there's um, the content is not visible anymore just by using SOPs. So now the only thing you need to do in your automation when you deploy to Kubernetes is an encrypt this file by using SOPs again. And then you will be able to use the config map to deploy um, in Kubernetes in the Kubernetes cluster. But this you can safely commit to your GitHub repository, right? You don't want to commit the unencrypted one, right? You want to commit the one that is encrypted. So as you create your config map, just delete it when it's unencrypted and just use the one that is encrypted. Okay, so the last step is 
now how to automate all of that. <laughs> and that's a lot. But luckily, DevSpace is providing all the tool set for you. So DevSpace, you just create like a folder, like deployed folder like I've done here. You install DevSpace, which is just a CLI. DevSpace in it is gonna ask you a couple of questions for your project, which language, um, this type of things. And it's gonna pre-populate a devspace.yaml for you. So a couple of things that are really important. So you want to run DevSpace in the dev mode. So the dev mode has many capabilities. Uh, it allows you to um, even create your own development environment by replacing the base image for your microservices. So let's say my joke worker or joke server has the Golang base image. But if I want, DevSpace can turn that image into my development environment. So it's going to replace that particular image with an image with all the tool sets you need for, you know, like kubectl, all those tools. And on top of that, it will still use the Docker file to copy your code and compile it. So it's super useful. Um, like doc, it's like Docker Compose on steroids in the sense that um, for the deployment, you're going to tell him, this is what I want to deploy. So like Docker Compose, I want to deploy the default MongoDB, the default Redis, the default NATS, and then this is where the magic happens for joke server and joke worker. The joke server, DevSpace, can create a Helm chart based on the container image. So again, that means you don't need to have knowledge about Kubernetes or about Helm. It's just going to be turning your container into a Helm chart. You give the container um, path if you want on the on the registry, and you can again specify an environment variable. Nothing hard coded there. You just specify it as a value, like before in Docker Compose. Same thing for my joke worker. Remember, I have a bit more information to give, and this is where you're going to give your uh, environment variables, like in Docker Compose, All right? So again, minimum Kubernetes knowledge and DevSpace is gonna build um, the wrap around your Docker containers and deploy all of that into Kubernetes uh, using your local, of course you need the cluster and you need to tell DevSpace which cluster you're using and that's basically it. Um, and then there's a super nice functions that hopefully is gonna work live again. So uh, here, I've got my uh, Kubernetes cluster. And if I go into my namespace, you can see I've got a dev namespace. Nothing is deployed there. So the only thing I need to do, is tell dev space, which namespace I want to use. And once I'm ready, dev space dev, and if we're lucky, it's just going to deploy everything. And uh, while it's de 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 um, deploying, the functions I want to show you specifically there is the hot reload. Um, so DevSpace by default is going to sync <clears throat> the file inside your IDE to the files inside the containers, which allows you to modify the code and you can specify what DevSpace should do every time you change a file. In our case, I just need to compile using the go run, right? That's basically it. So, and this is how I'm gonna turn the that joke generator into a, a cat <laughs> joke generator. So you can see here, now all my components are deployed. If I go into the logs here, I should see here, you can see that it's reconciling because Kubernetes is like, I'm deploying all the component, but not necessarily in a particular order. So here it's gonna, basically those logs are triggered by this space and it's gonna wait until all the components are ready, like Redis, MongoDB, and every time it's not ready, it's gonna restart the containers. So now restart container, it should be, it should be ready. And it's saying initial sync completed. So if I'm going into the, into the, 
the container. So I'm using K9S, by the way, which is super useful if you're managing Kubernetes environment. So if I go, want to go into the container, I just type S, and this is where, where I go. I can see that the joke worker is running, and it's not running as PID1. So I'm getting a bit detailed there, but this is how we kind of restart the process without having to restart the whole container is because the PID1 is the helper. So every time you change something, it restarts not the PID1, but the joke worker has another PID. It's not the PID1. So it doesn't need to restart the whole container, just restart the binary. This is how we can make your code, you know, just restart and rebuild everything. You can see the content there. If I do cats, uh, CMD, uh, joke worker, uh, main.go, it's my initial. If I go to internal, uh, sorry, if I go internal, I'm just checking, checking for dad uh, joke. Uh, that's joke.go, grep dad, right? Tell me a dad joke. This is what I'm, I'm saying to, um, to chat GPT, I mean to um, GPT-3. So now uh, let's try to just use the app, just using a quick curl again. So hopefully this one is going to be working. Okay, so this is my dad joke. So now I want to modify my code and let's do a catch joke. So again, I'm going into my internal joke, true.go. And here, I'm just gonna look for dad. Is there, tell me a cat. So I want to show you like, the restart here, exit here. I'm gonna show you the logs. So waiting for logs, as soon as I'm gonna save that, okay, restart container, restart the program there. So now if I go back into the code, again, if I do cat internal joke, joe.go grep for cat, it's there. And I didn't rebuild the image nothing. If I look at the process, the joke worker is running again. So now, if it works, cross finger, if I generate a joke again, should be a cat joke. What did the cat say when he lost his son? I'm at my wit's end. Okay. <laughs> and that's basically it. So yeah, that was the, the last part of um, that particular demo. So it shows you, you know, I think we went through all the different steps with this last one being probably the most important because now every time you deploy your code, you don't have to redeploy the whole application. You don't even have to build your container image. And the last thing now, if I do, if I'm done with my tests, just do dev space purge. And you can define also custom action for, oh, it's not, I'm not the right, so it's here. So control C, dev space purge, is gonna delete everything. So now terminating everything. So it's, you have a clean environment again, right? So that was it for the demo. I know I'm, I'm a bit over time, but I'm just gonna conclude. <laughs> yeah, enough time's up, thank you. So uh, hopefully it was fun. Um, at least it was fun for me building the app and going through all the, the process. Um, I know all the talks usually are quite, you know, abstracted in terms of uh, the tools you should use. So now hopefully you have a better, you know, hands-on experience of, you know, the different capabilities. Uh, I think that developing cloud native application is a lot easier than before. Probably like the last year or two years, a lot of tools like DevSpace, Tilt, Scaffold um, has been, you know, just more mature. And of course, the developer experience is, experience is fundamental for Kubernetes adoption so that Kubernetes becomes boring. I mean, boring in the good sense. A uh, couple of advice, I mean, don't overkill it. You can start small and focus on what makes your life easier. As the developer, we're probably, you know, very lazy people. You don't want to repeat yourself. So those tools I've showed today um, should be, you know, helping you to do that. Like, don't repeat yourself. Of course, one key component may security part of every stage of the application lifecycle. Just the minimum, what I've shown you today, sign your images, scan your images, encrypt your sensitive information. 
um, make sure you don't push sensitive information to your environment. Um, and also make your code and your environment, especially if you're a senior developer, uh, if you want to implement DevOps principle, share your coding environment, make it shippable so that you know, when you onboard new engineer, they can reuse what you're already using with standardization. Uh, is there a simpler way? So this is just to finish talking about Spectral Cloud again and connecting the dots. Um, we are using basically some of the Loft tools. So DevSpace is also from Loft. What DevSpace is doing from you, you can also do it from uh, Spectral Cloud, which is called Palette, that gives you a free Kubernetes cluster. You don't need Kubernetes knowledge at all. You just need to upload your application, define your application profile, just with a UI, as I showed you today with DevSpace, probably a much easy, um, you know, probably in a more easy fashion. Um, will take less time, but in the back end, we will provide Kubernetes cluster for you. You don't have to worry about the Kubernetes resources. You just have to worry about your code and about creating your application uh, profile. Again, call to action for you guys is, so this is the list of the tools we've used today. I didn't show you Git leaks, but it was basically the ability if I do commit my unencrypted file, it will generate an error message. So this is pre-commit and Git leaks. The only thing I didn't really have time to show. Install it, it's super easy. So Git, make file, Docker compose, dev space, pre-commit, Git leaks, sift, gripe, Kaiverno, caninus. All of that will help you in your local development. Um, yeah, if you want to try Palette as well, here's the link. And finally, if you want to learn more about, you know, Kubernetes management, the state of how people, you know, should deploy Kubernetes nowadays, uh, you can read this report by uh, Spectral Cloud. And that's basically me done for today. So hopefully you enjoy the demo and you learned something out of it. Thank you very much. There's Thank five minutes for questions. Um, yeah, but we have a preparation for the next uh, talk. So if anyone has questions or comments, um, please uh, discuss with Nick outside okay, we can the, do it offline. At the lobby. I'll be there around. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next presentation starts from 4 p.m. Another seven minutes. Uh, see you later. with internet connection. Thank you very much. Which one? Uh, yeah, it's good. This one is good. You don't have to use the span if you don't. Okay. It's in the way. Um, I I think it helps me not to move because if I hold the mic, I will. <laughs> is that I mean? Okay, sure. I think it, so. That's why it's helpful. Let me set up the. Um, Get the URL to it. Works. 
I will try. Yep. I think it kind of does work. Just checking the sound, just checking the sound. Okay, I won't. No, that, that works. Can I just move slightly over here? Because I know that my hand will work. <laughs> I can see myself. Good. So, uh, <clears throat> four, I'll do the introduction. Okay. All good. All good. Okay, so the time is time. Now, the next presentation is uh, by Aris Bilgin, and the title is Understanding Deeper Needs. Please, Aris. Thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I want to welcome you to a very different type of session today. Um, until this morning, we have seen a lot of good technical talks. We have seen a lot of things about technology and DevOps. Uh, this will be a little different than that. Um, this is my first time in Tokyo, but this is not my first time 
in DevOps Tokyo. Uh, last year, I was also a speaker and I spoke about the conversation styles and how we can have better conversations with other people last year. This year, I am going to be talking about something different, something different from the product development world. Um, the product development side is a huge space. There are a lot of good things about that. And one of the main ingredients in the space is this planet. It's that technology planet. And the technology planet provides us with really nice things like software development. Um, we do things about you know, operations. Um, we are responsible for you know, creating good um, architectures. We are responsible for making it run with quality, uh, waking, you know, making it run on a secure basis. So all of these are extremely important in creating a good user experience, in creating a good product. But while technology is very crucial in creating a good experience, this is not the only planet in the space. There's another planet. And that planet is the experience design planet. That planet is where things like service design happens. This is where designers look at how a certain service, how a certain experience should work so that it becomes real and it reaches the uh, end users. Um, people on this planet work on UX, UI design. They work on how a screen should work. They work on usability. They work on user research which is understanding what users need at different layers of the um, um, uh, process, at different points on the process, so that they can, understand the, uh, they can understand those user needs and bring that into the product development side. I love the other planet, the technology planet, but I actually live on this planet. My name is Aras. I work as a UX consultant, and I train um, companies in terms of using human-centered methods in their product development. Um, I have studied computer science in um, three various universities. I have also studied human-computer interaction, which makes me slightly between the purple experience design planet and the blue technology planet. I was glad to have the chance to work in many different types of organizations, big organizations, small organizations, finance and e-commerce in particular. And um, I um, am proud um, to share with you that either the products that I have worked on or the products that my teams have worked on have reached um, 160, more than 160 million users. So firsthand, I know how hard this is and how rewarding it is when it gets right. Um, out of these 160, I do not have any clients in Japan or I don't have any clients speaking Japanese, but I have a book in Japanese. Um, the, I wrote a book about user research. Um, it came out from O'Reilly. Uh, the book is very short and easy to read. And the goal is to teach anyone who is interested in learning from end users uh, to be able to do that in nine simple steps. Um, the book is available in English and in Japanese as well. I will be sharing a link at the end of the uh, uh, presentation, especially if you like the presentation. So um, that space the um, interaction between those two planets, it's actually working. Like technology teams like working with design teams, design and product teams do not have any problems with technology teams. I mean, yes, there is some problem in prioritization, timing, maybe quality, but overall, these planets are not at fight with each other. So why is it then, is it so hard to create good products? Creating Good experiences is hard because it is hard to collect actual needs from end users. And it is not hard because someone is, doesn't want it. It's hard because of our human nature. Um, we, as developers, we are not very good at asking what people need. And people, especially users, aren't very good at articulating what they need. So let's just give us an example. Let's say that we're working on a project and um, we need to find out what the, what the users need. We just say, hey, like, what do you need? And when we ask that question, the users start computing and say, well, well. And when they're done, they give us a list of everything that they can think of. 
whether they need it or not, whether they are you know, going to use it or not. So in that, we end up with a list that is not very useful. Asking users what they want doesn't work because they, that doesn't give us the need. There are three levels of determining what a user needs. The first level is what we have talked about. It is what they say they want. And this is an easy level because it's very crisp. It's simple. There are almost no disambiguities. I ask them what they want and they give me an answer. That answer may be wrong, but at least I have one simple answer. But this is a bad place to be. The second layer is a lot more interesting than this. At the second layer, we have what they actually need. This layer is not as simple and as straightforward as the first layer. This is where we need to have conversations with them. This is where there's a lot more ambiguity, uh, but it is actually not very easy to work here either. But at the very bottom, is where we need to be. The third layer is why they need what they're asking for. Now, this is an exciting place, but it is actually a little complex. There's a lot of ambiguity that is going on. Um, it's not shaped well. Um, you need to work a lot harder to be able to make sure that you have the right needs at this level. And because it is hard to work at this level, uh, most companies, most developers actually don't want to work there. They just say, tell me what, I, what you want and I will work on it. Even the best teams that want to do user research, that want to understand needs, they actually fail at this level. And I will give you an example from Japan, actually, a fantastic innovation from Japan, the Walkman. How many people had one of these? The original one? No, this, you had an original one. Wow, maybe one of these. These were more modern. I didn't have one of these, my cousin did. What about this one? The sports Walkman. So Sony had this amazing lineup of Walkmans. They made new models, they improved upon you know, things. This was based on the experience. The sports Walkman was a rugged, stronger made Walkman that was also waterproof. So you can take it to the beach, you can do sports with it. And they said, oh, idea. So they called in users to get opinions from them. And they said, well, welcome. We have a new Walkman, it's yellow. What do you think about it? And all the users that they have invited to test this with, they loved the yellow Walkman. They said, oh, you know, you're such a Walkman desu. They loved the fact that it was bright. They loved the fact that it was rugged. They loved the fact that it looked different. And this made the designers very happy. This made the product people very happy because users loved the product. And at the end of the study, they wanted to thank the participants. So for each user that came to talk, they said, We thank you for your time. And as a thank you for your a participation, we want to give you a free Walkman. Do you want a free black Walkman or a free yellow Walkman? And almost everyone picked the black Walkman. Everyone who said they liked the yellow one, they picked a black Walkman. So here's what happened. The people who did this study were at this level. But what they did afterwards was at that level. And this distinction is very important. Unfortunately, the technology people, we on the blue planet, we are not very good at this. We say, hey, like, you know, what do you need? And we just stop there. Sometimes we are even more lazy. We say, just open a ticket. I don't want to know why. I don't want to know who. Just open a ticket. I don't care. Worse, we sometimes become very lazy and say, well, it kind of works for me. This is how I would use it. I don't see any reason why anyone else would use it differently. And this is a very selfish decision. Um, even worse, 
we become arrogant. We become full of ego and say, this is good enough for them. There is no need for improvements. There is nothing that needs to change. Again, this is bad. Um, and we do that more often than, than, we, um, than, we want to, um, than we want to accept. But people on the other planet, they think about things differently. When you're doing experience design, you look at the user needs with multiple different ways. For example, one of them is listening. They listen in a different way. Um, they <clears throat> observe the users as they use systems. They discuss things with them in a very structured manner. They sometimes co-create. That is, they bring the users in. They ask them to be kind of designers and work on the product together. These principles are so central to experience design that there are multiple equally valid, equally applicable, equally strong frameworks for doing this. It doesn't matter which one you use, as long as you use a multiple variety of methods to learn from your users so that you can understand their real needs. Unfortunately, we only have a small slot today, so I won't be able to talk to you about everything on this slide, but I will be covering listening. I will be sharing five things that we can do to ask better questions and listen better so that we can understand user needs in a better way. I will be starting with the first one, that is preparation. When we say talking to the end user, this is usually what we think and see in our minds. It looks cool. Like you have this conversation with this you know, person who is interested in your product, but it is actually harder because to get here, you need to do a lot of preparation on your side. You need to know who you are talking to. You need to know exactly why you are talking to them. You need to know if they have any reservations. You need to do these because you need to have an emotional connection with someone to understand their deeper needs. <clears throat> so the step one in this is to understand and know who you are talking to. But it is not only about those emotions. There is something in us that makes it hard to have those conversations, and that is our brain. Our brain is very central to what we are doing, but it is an organ that we don't know how it works. We have an idea about what it does, but we don't know how exactly it works. Despite that, there are two things that we know about it that will help us through this. One is that it is always recording. Since we were born, our brain is always on the record. It records memories. It records things that we have seen. It records things that we have heard. So it collects all the good and the bad memories equally. The second thing is that it is very lazy. Our brain is taking its time in doing easy things. So when it wants to have a certain hard decision, if there's a shortcut, our brain takes that. And that shortcut comes from the recordings, all the things that the brain has recorded. And when it sees these you know, hard cases, it you know, falls back to those um, uh, shortcuts. Now, one of the challenging things is to meet new people and understand them at an emotional level to get to their needs. And this is a type of challenge that the brain wants a shortcut. When we see people, when we work with people that, are, that we're not familiar with, we immediately label them based on our experiences. We say, oh, you know, this person must be single. Oh, you know, foreigner. So we kind of make a list of things that we should do and we shouldn't do based on our experiences. And let me tell you, most of the time, these labels are wrong. We get it wrong because our brain is nasty and it's lazy. Uh, good UX researchers, people who work with end users, um, have these advanced methods uh, based on psychology to fight these biases. Uh, instead of going to that complex level, I am going to share with you two things that you can do immediately to control these biases. One is to list them, write them down. 
so that you can see them on paper and see if it makes sense or not. Discuss it with someone else because it's likely that your biases will not be 100% the same as someone else's biases. So discussion and writing things down help that a lot. The second thing that I recommend is about our body. Well, see, the brain is actually not different and separate from our body. When we put stress on our bodies, we also put stress on our brain. So if we are mentally and bodily ready for having a conversation, we will use less shortcuts. We will use less biases. This is super simple. Just go to the toilet, eat something, drink something, turn off the notifications on your cell phone so that your brain has the capacity and the attention to listen to the person whom you're speaking with. So once we are ready, we need to start having that conversation. And that conversation has to be in the right tone. We have to use the right speaking tone with the person that we're talking with. Um, most of the time, we start with just what you need. But there's actually different types of conversations uh, that we have when we speak with others. Uh, there are seven of these. Um, as I mentioned, if you're interested in these, I uh, suggest you to watch the session video from last year. Uh, I speak about some of these in my book as well. But the seven conversation styles appear whenever we talk to someone. Now, out of these seven, there are three items that I want to highlight. Two of them are bad, really bad. The first bad one is the interrogative style. This is where we feel that we are an investigator. We are a policeman. And we have to ask so many questions to the users to get answers from them. If they don't speak, it's our job to ask them more questions. Now, you see how this is problematic because there is no emotional connection. There is no trust. You are there to interrogate someone. Why would they help you? So do not do interrogative discussions when you actually want to learn from someone. The second bad example is the persuasive one. Um, this is when we try to sell someone our product. You see a lot of PMs do this with end users. They go and say, hey, why didn't you use that button? Or maybe it's better if you do it this way. And then they start selling the product. That is not a conversation. That is selling. To understand, you have to be on an equal level. And you don't have to have an agenda. You can't do this when you're trying to convince someone to get something from you. So what we need to do among these styles is to just pick one. And that one, the one that we need to pick is the empathetic style. This is the only style of conversation where we can have meaningful conversations that has good user needs. And empathetic conversations start with accepting the person as a human first. We respect their emotions. We respect who you are, who they are. And we treat them as human beings first, sources of information second. So with that respect and with that emotion, we can have better conversations. That got us over the first two. Let's move over to the third one, which is giving them space. Um, hi, brain. So we said that the brain records everything and it likes to be lazy. But there's something else about the brain. It is also very egoistical. It likes itself. It wants to think that it is wonderful. It wants to think that it has great ideas. It wants to think that it has figured it out. It knows everything already. And what, when brain thinks like, this, thinks like this, that seeps into our conversations. That seeps into the questions that we're asking. So instead of just asking someone their need, we ask them a question and then add answers to that, just to show that we know that there are possible answers. When we ask people what kind of practices that they do, we kind of want to also fill it with the buzzwords. Despite the fact that we may not know what those buzzwords are, we just want to say, Haha, 
I know. We sometimes let our own decisions take over the questions too. If we like EKS more than ECS, we lead the users to think that it is better because we say it's better. And we sometimes introduce really subtle cues. What is challenging about using Carpenter? Maybe there's nothing challenging, but by choosing the word challenging, you're asking for difficulty, you're implying difficulty. So if we want to get actual good needs from end users, we should stop leading them. We should stop asking yes or no questions. We should stop asking questions that are leading in essence, not in form, but in essence. And we should not ask add answers to our questions. The only thing that we need to do when we are trying to understand user needs is to just ask and shut up. Ask that question and just shut up. We have to listen more than we speak so that we can understand what our users need. That moves us over to the fourth aspect, which is going beyond opinions. Let's take two developers talking about the practices. The first developer asks, oh, you know, what's your procedure when you have a production outage? And everyone has production outage, but everyone handles it differently. There are different procedures and there are different ways that, you know, a production outage is handled. And because there's social pressure, the second developer starts thinking about the most common things that they do, not the worst, but the most common things that they do. And once he figures that out, he filters it a second time, filters it by what is appropriate to say. And then he gives an answer. Oh, you know, like we do an excellent job. We monitor everything. Our four keys are up. Like we have a proper elevation ex um, escalation pads. We write postmortems every time. And we know how certain as answers in this time may not be accurate. So most of the cases, the other developer then says, huh, you know, that's cool. And they stop here. However, people on the experience design planet know that there's something missing. People who know about the yellow Walkman knows that there's something missing. And they ask one very important question, which is, tell me how you did it last time. What was your experience last time? And that unbundles a lot of things because talking about a generic opinion is different than talking about the specific experience. And when you do that, the answer you get is completely different. Then you get the reality, which is very different than the opinion that was given. So when you want to get better understanding of user needs, ask for opinions, but then also ask for their experience too. Ask about how certain things happened last time. Ask about how different, you know, they handle the same situation. And when you do that, ask about both the positive and the negative aspects equally. When you only ask about the positive things, what is your best practice, whatever, you miss the pain points. When you ask about only the bad things, what is your challenge and what is your bad you know, um, experience, you don't know the good things that they have achieved. So you need to have this balanced approach. There's actually a great example of this that all Japanese speakers in this room know. It is a TV show. Why did you come to Japan? In this TV show, the TV crew goes to, I think, um, Narita Airport, and they catch people and say, why did you come to Japan? And if they like their answer, if they like the tourist's answer, they actually go with them. If you say, hey, I, I'm here to you know, visit you know, Mount Fuji, they say, yeah, let's go and visit Mount Fuji together. So they both ask for opinion and they look at the experience together, which is what we should be doing for um, user needs. Now, we talked about a lot of these things and it looks very cool. When you get to start talking to users you know, frequently, uh, you have a lot of conversations. You have conversations with peers, you have conversations with team members, end users, managers, directors. However, it has a toll on you. It is not easy 
for that brain to have this pace at the same quality. So once you get used to having those conversations, you need to give yourself time to process and reflect about what you have heard. Good, peop- good um, experience designers, good product managers who do this all the time, actually start this analysis and reflection process during the conversation. There are four times that every you know, conversation is analyzed at least four times. One is during the interview, once we are having the conversation. Second is right after the interview. The third one is after all interviews are done. And the fourth one is as we are find, you know, presenting the findings. So analysis and reflection doesn't end easily. It goes throughout the process, which means if you are having a one-hour conversation with a person, you have to give yourself maybe at least 30 minutes before to prepare mentally and bodily, and maybe give yourself at least 30 minutes more after the conversation so that you can reflect and understand what has happened. So we talked about these um, five aspects, five things that we can do to ask better questions and listen better. How does it work? How does it help us? I will share one business case and one personal case where we have used these methods to get better understanding. Um, I work a lot with banks, and this is one of my clients. Um, Ishbank is, a, um, is one of the largest banks in Turkey. Uh, it is not as big as, say, Mitsubishi Bank here, but the size is like 77 Bank, Chugoku Bank, or Gunma Bank, um, 75 billion, around 75 billion USDs in, uh, in assets, um, large you know, branch network across the country. And they wanted to get opinion about their product development process. So we started having meetings and conversations. Now, look at the offices. They are very serious. They have suits and ties. They take things super seriously. But in one of the conversations that we were having, they used a special word. They said, oh, and the work that we were doing is amelasyon. It's a made up Turkish word. Um, The close Japanese translation is like, Tanjun Rudosha Sheishin. It's like very low skilled, like unimportant work. Now, hearing people working in those buildings saying we do low quality work is one thing. Hearing them saying we make amelasyon is another. So we knew that there was an emotional connection. So we built upon on that. When we wanted to talk about efficiencies, we use this word. We use this liberally in our um, surveys, in our conversations, so that we had this shared language to speak about the same thing. And that got us to a good place of connection with the team that we were working with. There were many other consultants that worked with this team that uncovered certain obvious things. We were able to go at least a level deep to unearth other problems at the organization level, at the personal level, to come up with a better experience. Um, I will share a simple a personal um, uh, anecdote from one of my mentees. Um, the person that I was working with um, had issues in terms of the work stress. He was very stressed about the quality of the work. He was worried that he was not meeting the, the, di- the, the timelines. Um, he was concerned about how his uh, manager would be viewing him. So as a preparation step, I thought we would be talking about time management. I thought we would be talking about quality. But when I gave him the space to talk, when I did not lead him with questions, when I just asked my question and shut up, he started telling me about very different things. And in the end, we realized that he was putting a lot more pressure onto him beyond what was expected out of him because he wanted to feel more valuable. He wanted to feel that he is beyond expectations. And by doing that, even if he delivered everything on time, even if he delivered a very successful, very high quality project, he created a reason for himself to be sad. So the more successful he was, the sadder he became. We were able to get to that level because I was not leading. 
Obviously, we did not solve this problem in one session, but it pointed us to a better direction. It was a better indication of what he needed from me and as, a, as support. So it is easy to use these five approaches, but we are in a very, intelli very interesting time. We live in the time of AI, right? Everyone uses chat GPT, everyone does something with AI. So obviously the, the question is, you know, Arasan, don't you think that we can use ChatGPT to replace these conversations? Well, ChatGPT has an answer. I'm sure he will give you the same one, but I'll give another answer to this. Remember this model, the three levels. We, as humans, as you know, people who are doing this from a development side of things, we are here at the top. We need to go and get closer to this level. However, ChatGPT or similar generative AI technologies do not help us get down below. Instead, they create another layer on top of that. That layer is what LLMs think the users want. And that is extremely limited and common knowledge. It doesn't give us any good new information. Worse, you see on the top right, it also hallucinates. If you're using GPT, chat GPT for a while, you know that it sometimes fabricates things. And for us, there is no way for us to check. So adding chat GPT to this conversation will not replace good user research. It will not replace a good human connection to another human. At least we have these five things that we can do to understand users better. We can park our ideas and understand who we are talking to, to prepare better. We can be cognizant about the tone that we're using so that we can accept people as they are, as our users. We can give them space to talk about what they want without leading them. We need to go beyond opinions and ask both about the positives and the negatives of their actual experience. And we need to give ourselves time to process, reflect, analyze, understand, what our users, what our team members, what our peers, what our managers, what people around us need from us. I want to thank you for your attention today. Um, if you are interested in similar topics, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I have uh, put a link to the Japanese copy of my book on Amazon. If you're interested in the English copy, there's another um, link that goes to the um, English version as well. Once again, thank you for your attention, and I am very glad to take your questions. Any questions? Yep. Thank you for the presentation. Very insightful, very, very interesting. And I think this is a topic that is very broad. It can be applied not only for UX, not only for DevOps, not only for engineering and organizations. I think my question, um, as we are undergoing uh, some agile transformation internally in our organization, uh, we are trying to we have different schools of knowledge, people who are into Agile, people who uh, are getting introduced uh, into, into the new process. Um, I've, I was thinking maybe we could use some of these techniques in order to try to understand what are the barriers of those people who would like to learn to Agile and help us uh, join the journey. And I know this is a very generic, uh, open question but maybe you can share perhaps one or two thoughts about how we could use similar techniques in order for us to go throughout this transition okay um very good question thank you um and as you said a very broad question so i will give one answer based on what i have heard from you and one answer that may give you a broad maybe a different perspective in handling that translation you said that there are people from different sides and different expectations. So that's good. Step one, you did your preparation. You know that you're talking to people with different concerns. So that's very good. But then you said 
what can we do to make sure that they don't have those barriers? My suggestion is don't go to them and ask, what will stop you from being a barrier to this conversation? Um, ask them about their experience. Don't ask them about what their fears are. Ask them about how they feel so that you can have both the negative and the positive aspects. I have, like, I have not been a part of, but I have seen a lot of failed agile transformations. Complete waste of money. Everything was you know, back, but the team effort was fine because they were excited. So that's a good side of you know, an agile transformation that may go bad. So instead of focusing only on the negatives, try to ask questions that are open. Uh, try to hold meetings or workshops that, are, that come without that you know, bias. Um, don't try to crush them and say, oh, this is going to happen. You are, have to come along. Maybe they will voice something else. Maybe they have other concerns. So being, you know, you are prepared, you know, having that you know, right tone is another, um, you know, uh, good one. And take time to reflect on those because it's about people. And when you have those conversations, consider that there are other things that are going on as well. Um, I'll just, you know, take Tokyo as an example. Very big city. Almost no one lives close to where they work. So asking people what they think about an agile transformation after one and a half hours on a train will get you a different answer than asking about it, you know, at home, for example. Um, you can, that is the process and reflect part, you know, thinking about the answers. And if the answers or the conclusion isn't useful for you, do it again. You don't have one chance. You can do this over and over if you're being a good person as a converse, as a, you know, if you choose the right conversation style, if you're an interrogator, people will say, yeah, here's, here's again, like, what's your problem? Like, what, what are you asking? Don't be that person. And that's a choice that you can do. Um, on a general idea, um, there's a set of techniques called um, liberating structures. Um, I think there are 49 of them. Um, they are structured mini workshop techniques that allow multiple people to reach a consensus, show differences. Um, it is a very small book. There's also a page that you know, um, gives you the, um, uh, uh, a little overview. Um, there are coaching programs. I have not been coached on liberal structures, but I have been using similar methods in my work. And I can tell you that you can learn them by reading. You don't need coaching or God forbid certification. Uh, so liberating structures may be you know, um, one aspect and uh, you have the five steps. Good answer, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, uh, first of all, I like to talk, but uh, I want to be uh, the devil's advocate uh, if I'm allowed to. So um, if I'm really skeptical, I would say, okay, it's a very personal approach, with, which I think will succeed. But for me, it sounds very expensive time consuming um, and let's say, okay, like you interview 10 people, that doesn't give you entirely uh, maybe the good marks, uh, market sec segment. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, how, how do you counter that? The answer to your question lies in one of the slides, which I'm going back to. Those methods are developed with exactly what you were saying. Um, if you choose, to talk to users to answer a question that needs a statistical significance, then it's not a good research approach. Um, these methods have um, optimal paths to um, get the insight that you need in the shortest amount of time with the smallest number of people or with the data. Um, classical academic research requires you to hit certain numbers. It requires certain rigor. But when we do research to develop products, we care more about acceptable accuracy within the short period of time. So when we are, when we say, you know, when we need to know what our users need, for example, for a project, an academic approach may take six months to get the answer 100% right. When we do product research with these methods, we are aiming to learn about you know, 80 to 90% within two weeks. So that is the difference. Um, 
one of the mistakes that most new people into this area, especially product teams do is look at the numbers, right? How many, number, how many people we have spoken to represent the, the wide number? You pick that number based on your research question, the thing that you need to learn. For example, if you want to learn about what people think of the new um, landing screen, new uh, dashboard, a very bad thing to do is to talk to users or do a usability test. Instead, you should either look at the or send out a survey or look at existing data about what they have thought about. It. Uh, if you want to learn about how people use something, it is a terrible waste of time to send them a survey. It is terrible waste of time to actually talk to them. Instead, you do a usability study or you look at A-B testing. You look at clickstream data because those will get you the same amount of data with almost like 100% low cost because you already have it. Um, so it is a concern about accuracy, about cost. And again, like the methods that we have on this slide um, touch upon these. Um, I think you will have access to the slides. So I'll just point it out. The one in the middle, um, the, the white one, um, it's uh, from um, Christian Rohrer. It's a collection of different research methods sorted by quantitative, qualitative, and uh, uh, opinion and attitude. Um, it's on a, a, a Norman Nielsen site. And again, everyone can uh, ex um, uh, apply that. Uh, it is a concern, but with good planning, that becomes almost none of a concern. Uh, the reason that it becomes easy to handle is because when you have these five, a good well-planned research researcher or a team that learns from their users, they can run this cycle complete, like in a complete manner in one or two weeks. So it is possible to trim it down, uh, but it needs some sort of planning. Okay, thank you. It was a good question. And unfortunately that was not the depth that we were at today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a really good uh, presentation and uh, like you to hear it's uh, the connection in between those two planets. It's broken most of the time. So uh, thank you. Good. Uh, we, we discussed about the needs and there are some uh, times uh, that we need to give our requirements to other end. Uh, in that case, what is the uh, most uh, efficient way uh, give our ideas, our needs to the other end uh, to get the maximum output from there. Right? You may not like my answer. <laughs> um, this is the reality of working in big corporations or big projects. <clears throat> Sometimes someone with the power to change things come and say, I want this button to be purple. And everyone on the team says, that doesn't make sense. It's wrong for the user. And you know, you can have a, like one of these, you can have researchers, you can have product managers say completely the opposite. Unfortunately, data doesn't always change opinions. So if you're working in a corporation, in a project that is very power oriented, hierarchical, I am sorry to say that there may not be a lot of things to do. What this can do is to say, we're making it purple because Mr. Someone wanted it. We don't say it as, oh, it's a user need. No, it's Mr. X's need. Um, as I said, I live on the um, purple planet, the experience design planet. And I have worked with a lot of CEOs who think that they are Steve Jobs. It's like, oh, I didn't like this screen. I showed it to my wife and she didn't like it either. So your wife is never going to use our screen. Your wife is never going to be a paid customer and probably never going to be in the segments that we are going to be working actively with. So that's an unnecessary you know, feedback. If we can't stand in the way of that, we can use research to say it's not you know, user-centered. Uh, the hopeful answer is you can still learn from 
end users without asking them. So if the requirement is top down, you can say and challenge it maybe, is this actual user need or are we doing it to make our brains look good? Are we doing it to get a promotion? Are we doing it to just like fill those velocity, you know, gaps in our, you know, burn down, whatever. Um, for everything else, we can use these methods or similar methods to end, you know, learn from the end users and hopefully slowly shift that top down to more of a user-centered um, uh, approach. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bad reality. We all, we all have to go through that. <laughs> Okay, I think that was the last question. It's okay. time now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, the next presentation would be a, from 5, 5 p.m. It will be a video presentation. Yep, see you uh, again later.
、今これ、音声共有されてたら、ちょっと似てる感じですかあの、画面、画面共有して言ってるな。So, good morning. I've got a question. Nobody? I know there's at least somebody in the audience hiding who has heard the answer to this question before, but I think he forgot. Yeah, Anton forgot. Okay. Typically, when I ask this question, people shout. I don't know. Don't know. イヤホンつけときはまああんまり気にしなくてもいいのかもしれないけど。When I ask this question, people shout Ghent! It's not in Ghent. This is the marble room in the Antwerp Zoo where、um, in April 2000, I know there's at least those where this is. Nobody? I know there's at least somebody in the audience hiding who has heard the answer to this question before, but I think he forgot. Yeah, Anton forgot. Okay. Typically, when I ask this question, people shout, Ghent! It's not in Ghent. This is the marble room in the Antwerp Zoo where、um, in April 2009, Patrick Dubois and I got the crazy idea to organize a small conference to invite like 70 of our best friends talking about development and operations and bringing them together. And it, it's basically. Okay.
Okay, so it's 5 p.m. We'll be having the, the final presentation for the first day. Uh, it will be the video presentation by Chris. Uh, the title is From DevOps to DevOps, uh, 13 years of uh, bracket not learning. And after this presentation, uh, the, after this video, we'll be having a networking at the lobby. So, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll be starting the video now. So, good morning. I've got a question. Who knows where this is? Nobody? I know there's at least somebody in the audience hiding who has heard the answer to this question before. But I think he forgot. Yeah, Anton forgot. Okay. Typically, when I ask this question, people shout, Ghent! It's not in Ghent. This is the marble room in the Antwerp Zoo, where um, in April 2009, Patrick Dubois and I got the crazy idea to organize a small conference to invite like 70 of our best friends talking about development and operations and bringing them together. And it, it's basically where we had the idea to start DevOps Days. And that's how this whole movement started. Um, we did a small thing in Ghent, 70 people. The format of the conference was we had formal talks like what's happening here today in the morning. And in the afternoon, we had open spaces. And the open space concept where people share their experiences, talk about their problems, and discuss amongst their peers, that is actually what made the conference really popular. A um, bunch of people that were in Ghent took the ID back home. Um, they took it back to the States. They took it back to Australia, uh, actually to uh, Brazil also. And then the year after, we ran a similar event in Hamburg. And we kept on doing the same. Uh, we toured in Europe the first couple of years, Göteborg, Rome, and then things started exploding. Uh, 2013 was the year where we had Amsterdam, Paris, two times in London, and a couple of things. Um, right before the pandemic, we celebrated the 10th year anniversary of DevOps in Ghent. Um, we had people from all over the world, and it was really painful to see how things evolved. If you look at where we started ages ago, it was a group of people who had solid experience in using open source technology at scale, contributing to open source projects, and working with those things. They were also practicing a lot of the agile principles. And they were dabbling their feet into the first cloudy style of things. And if, if you look at the joint of those three things, that is where DevOps started. And I think even the biggest part of that was the fact that it was based on an open source movement. And it still is a large open source style community. So who can define DevOps for me? Okay, who's awake? Raise your hand if you're awake. Okay, half of the audience is awake. Okay, probably something to do with the low coffee here. So lessons learned, they're probably gonna need to have coffee earlier tomorrow because otherwise the rest of the audience is gonna sleep. Okay, I admit defining DevOps is something which is really, really hard even with coffee. So let me start with putting up a slide I used with Patrick in uh, the date is still under. Um, 12 years ago, we spoke at DevOps, and we defined DevOps as a global movement to improve the quality of software delivery, leveraging our open source experiences back in Ghent in 2009. And as you can see, the conference back then was 
around this time, a bit after Halloween, and we had a werewolves and vampires team. So the slides were a bit bloody, but it still shows the state of what DevOps is today. It's not a shiny, happy news. Not everything is perfect. When I read Tom Lyman Sally's blog post this morning about um, Lisa basically isn't needed anymore because everybody is doing automation and everybody is happily working together and having CI in place, I was like, hmm, maybe in your part of the world or in your little silo, but what I'm seeing out there is still that there's way too much manual stuff being done and people are still not testing what they put in production. So we still have to do this. We still have to teach people on how to do software delivery better. And if you look at what DevOps Days did, 10 years ago we started. At the peak in 2019, we had 75 to 80 events a year. That's not including the events like this one, who are also talking about what's happening in this community. So this is a really growing community. This is a really huge community. If there's at least 1,000 people organizing events like this, then what about the practitioners? So who am I? Um, I'm Chris. In the late 90s, I used to be a Java developer, PHP developer a bit later. I also did Perl and lots of other languages, even did Pro C. And at some point, I was the only one who knew how to rack a Spark into a rack and cluster it. So I became an operations person. Um, my day job is helping people to deliver software. Um, Inuit is one of the larger open source consultancies in Europe. We're about 150 people in, in Europe. Uh, we just spun off Oli, which is a Prometheus consultancy. We're helping you with Prometheus and everything around it. And I did co-found DevOps Days. Next to DevOps Days, I also co-founded Convict Management Camp, which is happening again in February in Ghent. But what I'm mostly being cursed at is the title of my blog. Because people point at me when they figure out they run into another DNS problem. So why am I talking about this? Well, I think we need to look back at history. We need to look why we started the movement, or we didn't really want to start it, but why we caused these things to happen. And we need people to learn from these mistakes, because we keep making them over and over again. It says the old days. Because for lots of environments, this is still current business. For me, the story was when I was working at a large telco, and I was sitting in the engineering team, and suddenly marketing shows up and says, hey, we, we need to have this new website live. Uh, OK, so here's a tarball. Some external party developed this. Uh, yeah, but um, we don't have servers for this. I mean, keep in mind, this is mid-2000, bit earlier, well, probably even earlier, beginning of 2000. We don't have servers for this. Do you need a database? How about security? Are we, do you want this to be high available? How many users do you expect? And we're going to like, ah, well, there's a radio commercial at 5. Just make it happen on a Friday afternoon. Who's had this experience? Who's had, I see some, who's had this this year? And we didn't like it. We, we were like, we can do better. We don't want some developers to just throw some, something over the wall and then have to deal with it. So looking at how things have evolved, for me, is looking at the topics that DevOps Days has in the open spaces. And if you've ever been to a DevOps Day, you see the patterns. I can predict that at one of the future DevOps days this year, somebody is going to have an open space about power maps. Not kidding, it happened twice already this year. Somebody wants to organize an open space about monitoring and metrics. And you see those things evolve. So let's have a look at how we started doing this. 
In the early years, when we were talking about culture, which is obviously the biggest part of what DevOps is about, we were looking at a number of unicorn startups that were the poster child of our movement, that were the people who were, we were looking after them. It's like, yes, that's how we want to work. There were success stories on people telling us how they achieved much faster and much more stable deployments. And we were talking about how to adopt things like Lean and Agile and Kanban. And if you see those same topics pop up in the talks right now, you, you see people saying, Agile doesn't work. Um, we see large enterprises who come and talk about like the really, really small team that's really agile and forget about the rest of their organization. And we've even reached the point where people on stage can actively talk about anti-patterns, things that we know that won't work. And then six months later, they have to admit that, oh, well, it didn't really work for them. Way too many events have topics like burnout and mental health, because there's something still really wrong in this industry. So we went from the good news show to, hey, this is how we do things, to lots of people being frustrated and burned out and not having seen real solutions. When we talk about technology, we went from discussing tools, we went from early adopting tools like Steve Engine and Puppet and Chef and later things like Ansible and, and Terraform. We were talking about how to do orchestration. I mean, this is 2011. We were talking orchestration across large clouds. We were talking about CI tools, how to really do deployments. And if you look at the topics right now, it's people, I mean, we jokingly call the second day of config management camp YAML camp because that's what we become. We've all become YAML engineers. And who likes YAML? There's one person here who had coffee. <laughs> so all the variety we had into being able to choose what kind of tools we used and to say, hey, we, we want to use different things and, and learn from each other. We're slowly getting to a monoculture. Um, and not everything is this code yet. Definitely not. When we were talking about continuous deployment, continuous delivery, continuous integration, back then it was about teaching people, even system engineers, that they needed to adopt version control. That, well, back then we were still thinking that Git flow was a real thing and that it was something that could help you. And we were teaching people our release management and things like that. Right now, today, we still need to teach people how to use Git, how to do version control. But now we have a different caveat. We need to let them unlearn all the mistakes they made. Long-running branches, merge hell, all of those things, like stop branching, do trunk-based development. If you look back at the early definitions of continuous integration, there's no long-running branches there. Those are the anti-patterns. And we see now that for lots of organizations, CICD means continuous disintegration and continuous destruction. If we look at DevOps, some people describe it as the CAMPS movement, culture, automation, monitoring, measurement, and sharing security. So monitoring and metrics is obviously something that we really care about. Um, we did a study early on, which we presented at Ottawa Linux Symposium in 2007, 2008. And when we looked at the state of open source monitoring tools back then, it was mostly, there were two. It was not just, and everybody hated it because it was hard to configure. There was bloated commercial stuff, which we ignored, we still do. And then there were a bunch of tools that were allowing us to do metrics and things like that, but it were really, really hard to set up, or they didn't scale at all. And I think it was 2011, 2012, when John Vincent loses on Twitter, said monitoring sucks, and the monitoring sucks hashtag started to become really popular because we, we were frustrated as an industry with the state of open source and the state of tooling. And then change started happening. Now we have an ecosystem where we have much more mature monitoring tools. We have things like, well, it used to be Graphite, now we have 
tons of time series backends like Cortex and Tunnels and, and all of those things we have Prometheus if we have scalable ecosystems. Um, and, and we moved from hating monitoring to loving monitoring. Ulf Manson gave a talk at DevOps Days Rome in 2012 where he talked about his newfound love for monitoring. And he had his kids actually draw his slides and it were happy hearts. But his newfound love was not about the tools. Well, it was partly about the tool he started liking, but it was mostly about the fact that he was automating his things. And he didn't have inconsistent states anymore between what was supposed to be running and what the system thought was running. He was automating his monitoring to a point where it was built in. And it was part of a thing rather than something that happens afterwards. And now we're talking much more about things like tracing and the three pillars of observability. But lots of organizations are still not there yet. They still need to get to the point where they fix their alert fatigue. So while some people in the industry are looking at how do they do tracing, how do they, do, how they really do much more advanced things than just monitoring, how they really go to observability, the massive amount of the industry is still not there yet. So it's still not food. Clouds. In the early days, we were talking about virtualization technologies, how to fast deploy things large at scale. Uh, we were talking about doing things which are really resilient and using the tools that were available to do so. We were talking about storage and distributed file systems because if we were doing things at scale, we needed to have fast and stable access to our data. And we were talking about open source implementations on how to achieve those things anywhere. How many of these tools are still around? OpenStack is still alive, the rest is it's disappeared. What are we talking about now? Well, not now, but six, seven years ago, things started. People are just starting to talk about Docker, Docker, Docker. We moved from giving developers a vagrant box that allowed them to spin up a production-like environment and develop in there to just Docker, Docker, Docker. And it didn't help. If you look at most ecosystems now, they don't have a distributed file system they can trust. They store their files on NFS. NFS is a file system we tried to abandon in the early 2000s. I still remember Olaf Kier giving a talk at LinuxConf with on every slide of the titles, he had the explanation of what NFS stood for. Um, some of them I still remember. No file system, need for speed, um, network failure system. Those were not the kind of tools we wanted to depend on. But still, today, here we are. Um, most Kubernetes ecosystems I know, they just store their files on NFS. And we tolerate this. So yeah, Docker is really the tool that helped us forward in dividing the gap between developers and operations people. Because now we give people a container they can build locally, they can run locally, and then it's an ops problem. How do you network it? How do you secure it? Who's responsible for the container afterwards? So this tooling hype where at some point people even branded Docker the ultimate DevOps tool, and people jumping on those tools like, hey, we really need to use these tools because otherwise we're not doing the DevOps thing. It really didn't help us. So we learned from this, right? <laughs> I was really happy when, beginning of the year, people started to talk at conferences again that, well, even Google was talking at DevOps Days Prague, like maybe you do not need Kubernetes. Maybe this is not something which is fit for you. I mean, I love it. It's a really great piece of technology if you need it. But most organizations have absolutely no use or they fail to adapt their infrastructure and they fail to adapt their application so they can benefit from it. The old lift and shifting. We're going to put it in the cloud. We're going to put it in Kubernetes now. 
and the end result being not so nice. If you architect for Cube, awesome. If you don't, maybe rethink. Like, cargo culting is real. People jump onto something looking at, oh, Google is doing this. We should, maybe not. This is what's happening. People go to conferences, they hear about a new fancy tool. This is going to solve their problem. And then they fail to change how they actually use it. We're going to go to the cloud. Here's a five paper form you need to fill in, and then somebody in IT will spin up a VM. But we're on Amazon now. And they're going to fail, and they're going to say, this doesn't work. Observability. <laughs> I mean, we're doing a lot of Prometheus work, and the number of times people come to us and say, hey, we want Prometheus because our monitoring is broken. It's not broken because you're using a Kinga. It's broken because you're manually configuring it, and you're not fixing the problems you have. Yeah, we can switch you to Prometheus. We'll help you. But it's not going to fix the fact that if you don't have a single source of truth and you let people manually configure it, which is obviously with Prometheus a bit harder, it's still going to be painful because you need to make sure that it's completely automated. You need that single source of truth. But people just, nah, I want the UI in front of it. I want some people to be able to add services to, the, to configure it. That's not going to work. You're not going to fix the problem. So what I learned over the past decade is that this industry is really good at killing awesome things. And we keep doing it. Who likes Ittle? Most of us don't. Who's actually read the books? So Ittle today is perceived as the people who sit on a Friday morning at 10 a.m. in a meeting saying, no, we're not going to do this. And sometimes they have valid reasons for not wanting to do this. OK, agreed. Mostly they don't because they have totally no idea what's happening. But the idea behind it is to reduce the risk. Continuous delivery, the idea about doing frequent, small incremental changes is to reduce the risk. The idea of collaborating and testing and doing all the automation we do is to reduce the risk. The thing we did, however, is we moved from 10 people in a room with no clue on a Friday morning to let a CI say, yes, this is going to fail, this is successful. And we automated that, and we improved that. And why those people might have the same ideas and the same concepts, their language was different. So if you take a number of the concepts from what's in the libraries and you automate them a thousand times, you probably end up having what you want to have. Sadly, there's also a bunch of people who just looked at this as a rigid set of rules which you had to follow without understanding them. And that's when problems start happening. Agile is dead. For a lot of people, Agile is dead. And why is that? Because they've never seen Agile. They started out doing waterfall, nine months projects, we'll deliver something in nine months, and they figured out, well, this isn't going to work, we're going to deliver something in six months. But during those six months, you're going to do stand-ups and sprints, and you get Jira. Yay. And they called that scaled Agile. I mean, Martin Fowler has the explanation what STAVE stands for. Um, it stands for Shitty Agile for Enterprises. I still think it is the best waterfall methodology out there. So if you, as a large corporate, are using SAFE, it's probably better than what you had before, but it's not Agile. So people say Agile is dead, but they've never seen it. So who killed DevOps? <laughs> We did. I mean, I'm responsible partly for doing this. Uh, the first years of DevOps, I talked to pretty every conference that asked me about a talk, and the talk was titled, Seven Tools for Your DevOps Stack. I think it was Vagrant, Puppet, Graphite, um, 
I don't even remember. I do remember the seventh one. And the seventh one was the human being. It was you, it was people collaborating and talking to each other. The problem is that most people went home and just implemented the six other ones and failed to understand that it was about the people. I did a rebound on that uh, and it was another seven tools for your DevOps stack and people still didn't get it. We also were talking to people and saying, hey, the discussions about Puppet versus Chef versus Ansible, which tool should you use? And, and the only answer lots of it had was yes. I don't know which one, no, yes, use a tool. Stop discussing which tool, figure out which tool your friends use, learn from that tool and automate. And then when you improve, you'll figure out the finesses between which tool is better suited for what, but stop discussing, start using it. And then there's people who implemented all the tools. Like, okay, that's not gonna work. And then there was Docker, obviously. Who's a DevOps engineer? Again, one person had coffee, the rest is sleeping. <laughs> DevOps is not a job title. It never has been, it never will be, unless your organization fails to understand what DevOps is about. I mean, what is a DevOps engineer? Is that a Java developer who runs production? Is that somebody who is in charge of the CI tools? Is that somebody, is that a, an ops person, but who's also fixing bugs in production? Oh no, that's a service restart engineer. Oh, that's SRE for those who didn't get it. Um, Ken Mugridge found a job advert um, for a DevOps engineer, and it was, it was somewhere you don't want to live probably, but um, they were paying zero salary. I mean, that was a recruiter that got it. He realized it was not a job. So what happens if you have a company that is hiring DevOps engineers? They put them in a DevOps team. So on one side you have the developers, on the other side you have the operations people, and we were not happy with people just throwing things over the wall. Uh, we just put another wall, we just put another silo in between. Oh, there's also a release management silo, there's a bunch of tooling silos, and the whole idea was to break down the silos and to get cross-functional teams that could take ownership. So by introducing a DevOps team, you kind of went the other way. I did a large project ages ago with a large big bank in the Netherlands. Um, and when I arrived there, they said, well, we're gonna do this DevOps thingy. We just created 250 DevOps teams. Like, okay. And what they did, they were actually merging their development and their operations teams and putting both managers on top of one team. Yeah, it had some struggles. So, We kill things, and we kill things because we don't know, we don't realize it. But one thing that I learned is that there's something that really kills things. Scrum, to me, got killed by people hanging out their Scrum certification next to their Prince2 certification, next to their ITIL certification, not understanding what they were doing, but just following the rules as they were written. So there's no such thing as a DevOps certification, because you can be certified in knowing a tool or something, but how can we certify people that they can collaborate, that they are good human beings? DevOps Days Berlin 2014 figured that out as a joke, and they were basically certifying everybody who came to DevOps Days for being DevOps certified. At DevOps Days, again, the fifth anniversary, we handed out certificates and if you can see the small print, it's actually the University of Dev and Oops. <laughs> and yes, we gave the first one to Bernd Erk, who did it in, in, in Berlin. So there's no such thing as DevOps certification. There's no such thing as an exam you can go to and say, hey, we've done this. You can learn, and you can go to trainings and, and practice and do things, but it's really hard. 
And we've seen that from history. Like, Intel certified people, they might know the book, but they might not understand it. If you think Agile is a procedure where on Monday you do sprint planning, you do sprints every day, you have all the ceremony in place and you follow it by the rule that you're doing your Agile? Hmm, not really. I mean, let's be honest, certifications, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are just milking users for more revenue. There is one exception, however. Look this one up. I got certified two weeks ago. This is really the best certification out there. Defining what DevOps is about and, and trying to help people is really hard because there's always going to be vendors out there who are going to try to get people into the easy path. And they're going to try to find new ways to explain to people what DevOps is for them. Vendors will try to find something that they can renew. Um, I've seen a large, big, blue-logoed company trying to sell a subscription of DevOps to a financial institution. And they were trying to rebrand the products they had already sold to them two years before under a different name. And it's not the only one who did that. So this thing is, it's, it's hard. Um, I think it's also Ken Magridge who said, you cannot buy DevOps, but you might have to sell it. You might have to tell people and convince people that this really is about collaboration, that it's not about those tools. And definitely in enterprises, it, it's really hard. There's people who claim that there's something different between DevOps in the enterprise and the other one. I don't know what the other one is. I mean, the truth is, the more people you have to teach, the more people you have to change their behavior, you're going to get into more friction. You're going to have more people who are going to say, mm, we don't really like this. We, we, we've been through five transformations before. We've already changed our way of working four times. So yes, large organizations are harder to change. It, it's going to take much longer. There's also much more to change. And at some point, and this is Martin, Michael Brunton's Paul, this quote, at some point in those large organizations, the antibodies kick in. That's when they actually start wanting to change. So what we see in a lot of those large enterprises is that they don't really change. There are small teams in there that change. There are small teams that become much faster where you can do really awesome things. But the basic fundamentals of those organizations don't really change because they don't see the need to really change. I stopped doing coaching. I stopped doing transformations in organizations because I just couldn't bring up the energy anymore. I realized that most large organizations aren't even close to what we consider DevOps or even Agile. And their culture is so broken that from the engineers on the floor, they always lie their way one up. Yeah, it's, it's ready for production. Uh, well, well, we still have about six months work, but if we do that, they're going to kill the project. So the manager one line up is going to say, yeah, yeah, it's in production. Yeah, it's live in production. And the CIO gets the message, everything is healthy, everything is running, it's all live up in production. And they announce that to the town hall meeting and the engineer on the floor says, uh, we still need to do the first commit of this. DockerCon, first one in Amsterdam, there was somebody on stage saying, hey, we use Docker internal. It was a large bank. I went to ask him, can you show me the team that actually uses Docker? It took me 18 months within that organization to find the first team to use the tool. But C-Level was going outside and saying, we're using this tool. They weren't. They didn't realize they weren't, but they weren't. 
And that is what's happening in large organizations. And people are frustrated with that. And that's how we end up having topics like burnout at lots of conferences and how to deal with it. So if I can give you one big tip if you want to try to do this, do not call it a DevOps transformation. Do not even call it DevOps. Call it, call it platform engineering for all I care. Call it engineering 2.0. Call it the new SRE team. Because if you call it a DevOps transformation, people are going to assume that they know what DevOps is about. And 10 people in one room, they're all going to have a different ID. They're all going to have a different definition. So what you want to do is say, hey, we're going to do this engineering let's skip three, 4.0, and these are our goals. And as an organization, we want to move forward and try to achieve these goals. And somewhere in the back, there might be some people saying, hey, that's what I heard at DevOps days or SRECon or whatever, and this is cool, we want to do this. But if you say, hey, we want to do DevOps, they're going to go like, so that's, I read this article, we're going to do this. No. Put up your own charter, put up your own ideas, and see based on what your organization needs, what you want to do. Yeah, uh, don't call it the Spotify model. <laughs> so we're 13 years later. Yes, I'm recycling these slides because sadly it still needs to happen. And to me, sadly, this is still where we are. If I'm not running a containerized infrastructure, I have one comment and I figure out if I need to patch for OpenSSL. Tuesday was a public holiday in Belgium, so somebody on our check team just ran that one check. We were fine. And then we needed to start figuring out what the developers had put inside the containers, and we wasted another four hours to figure out. Yeah, so. Who's owning it? Who's collaborating? Um, here's a Docker image. How did you build this? Why is it four gigabytes? <laughs> How do we monitor this? What do you mean you don't have a health endpoint? You don't have a metrics endpoint? Um, I would love to say that it happened only once but it happened way too many times. The Docker container restarted, I lost my data. So we moved from here's a tarball to here's a container. Ops problem now. Our industry has been running around in circles for ages. Yes, even the People who went to DevOps Days Amsterdam at some point and got a light Lego minifig, they've been running in circles. We see patterns happen over and over again. We go from big monoliths to microservices to things in between, and people who are my age or older will acknowledge that and will figure out, like, I've seen this before, they're going to hit that wall, they're going to make that mistake. And the youngsters are going to go, ah, those old farts again. I'm not going to listen, we know it better. They might hit the wall faster, but they're going to hit the wall. When we were doing large-scale infrastructure deployments with System Image, we still remember System Imager. Ah, that's right, you still need coffee. We were shipping huge images, and the problem with those huge images was that we couldn't modify them fast enough, and we couldn't actually figure out how to make them evolve. So we went from shipping large images to building just enough operating system and then configuring the inside of the image. You know how Docker works with overlay file systems, right? didn't fix the problem, we recreated it. 
And I can give you multiple more examples of this. So it's really time for all of us to take a step back and look at what we really want to achieve. These things are not going to help us. I mean, resume-driven development. Where can I get my next gig that is going to pay me just that bit more? Oh, I need to do Kubernetes. Oh, high-driven development, cargo-driven development. And the, the rise of YOLO ops. You folks know YOLO ops? It's Silicon Valley-based development. You're not building something for a user. You're building something because your company needs to be sold, and in two years, you don't care anymore. Mm, YOLO. These things are not helping us. The success stories we hear are not always success stories. Change does happen. I've seen, I mean, I worked with a lot of large organizations. I've seen lots of teams completely change the way they're working and become happy. But I've never seen a whole organization change. Is that bad? Not always, it's good. If those people changed, if they're happier, if they're feeling better, it's perfect. But you need to realize that what an executive says on stage might not be the truth. It's going to be a long journey for all of us. Some of you are at the beginning of your career, some of us are somewhere in the middle. And that means that young organizations are also going to grow. They're going to have their growing pains and things that you assume that are trivial because you've done them for ages. When new people join, they're not going to assume that those are trivial. You need to keep teaching people about the mistakes you made. You need to make sure that they understand why you're doing the things you do because you prevent things from happening. And you need to embrace new technologies, see where they apply best. And if you have a good use case for Cube, do it, but not because you heard at a conference that Kubernetes is the solution to all your problems. We need to really teach people to not shoot themselves in the foot. I don't know, I never had it, but it feels painful and you want to prevent those people to have pain. And I think for all of us, our roles are going to be a mix of this. We're going to need to teach people how to collaborate, how to understand technology, while at the same time constantly be learning new technologies and learning new practices. Everybody is going to need to write code. Everybody's going to need to learn to debug a problem. And we all are going to need, again, to build bridges between different types of knowledge. We're going to need to share our experiences and talk about how to do things the right way, being an evangelist for the small victory in your own team, but also for the larger victories. And we're going to need to learn to listen to our peers and figure out where their pains are and how we can help them. And all of that is really what DevOps is about. It really is not about those tools. It really is about changing how you work together, and it is about you, about the people you work with on a daily basis. Thank you. OK, uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, it's all heady topics, so bear with us. The first one, and I agree with what you said, but someone in the audience does not. Um, why do we have to stop branching? Because apparently there's a lot of discussion. Not to me, probably not to you that much. But, so the um, timer says we have 40 seconds, so I need about an hour. Uh, but I'm going to have a better idea next year. I'm going to send you somebody and invite him to give a talk about okay. it. <laughs> in continuous delivery, the title of the talk is In Continuous Delivery, Branching is Considered Evil. Um, look it up. You're hiding inventory, you're basically getting into merge conflicts, and 
you're shooting yourself in the foot. That's what you're doing. And once you are doing trunk-based, you never want to go back. But I'll hook you up with a great speaker for next year. All right. Then another one, which, yeah, same thing all over again. Um, when to build your own tools versus what's available? Sorry. So, yeah, yeah. So they are asking about like when, when it, how can you decide when to build your own tools versus grab something that's available and potentially improving it? So there, there's when to build your own tools, when to grab something that's available. The first thing already to me is like there's so many awesome open source tools out there. That should be your foundation. That should be your baseline. Um, you're going to do things in your organization that might not be a perfect fit, and you're going to need to build the glue to do something. But you probably do not need to build a whole new tool. Um, you might want to have some tool that gathers some information from third party systems, from your project management teams, um, things like that. But look at what is around in open source, build on top of that, and then maybe figure out where to fill the gaps with some duct tape, with some glue. So someone is, is doing kind of the analogy that, like, is DevOps something like Agile to bring together devs and ops in a way? I, um, I don't know what... I, I've read about Kaizai, but it's ages ago, so I'm, I cannot really comment on, on the exact details, but I think John Willis has a talk about that topic. And I think the answer is yes, but he probably has a better answer. Okay. And the final question, because we are running out of time, is like, someone who is probably a team lead, um, if doing good DevOps is a culture problem, how can I tell that to my team so that they start focusing on culture and not, you know, potentially writing pristine YAML or things like that? Okay. Some advice. It's some advice to some team lead that is trying to tell their, their team, like, um, so if good DevOps is a culture problem, what do I tell my team so that they realize it's about culture and not tooling? Or if you can bring some advice, of course, because it's always tricky. Um, the first problem is, does the team realize what the problem is? Do they feel pain? Is it just you, or does the whole team feel pain? And once you realize the whole team feels the pain, you'll be able to pinpoint at least where some of the pain is coming from. If it's just you who doesn't fit within the team within the organization, I think there is lots of people out there hiring. Um, but once people as a team figure out that there is a problem, they'll realize it's not the tooling. It, it typically is a human problem. It is about communication. It is, it is about interactions. All right. Thanks for answering the questions. And again, big round of applause for Chris, who kindly came here today. Thank Thanks for a great keynote. OK. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you very much. That was the last presentation for today. Um, uh, quick information about tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will be starting from 10 AM. We have opening from 10. And then after that, we will have the second day's keynote from 10.30. Yep. So if you want to uh, check the detailed schedule, please uh, check the conf engine. OK, thank you very much. And uh, for the people who's at the offline uh, place at Osaki, so we'll be having a networking party right after this. We'll be um in the beginning i said we'll be having at the lobby but we'll be also using this room and the other room as well we'll be moving the walls so um please uh stay at where you're sitting right now we'll be uh preparing okay thank you very much <laughs>